Five thirty one. Recording in progress. We have a few people struggling to get on. All right, if you want to carry on conversation, take them out. Out of the room. Morgan. Showtime, folks. Second up is public comment for any items not on the agenda. Right, I have a hand in the far back. I just wanted to, to say state my your name for the record. Ramsey Pack, Randall. Um, I um, also speaking on behalf of Chandler. I just wanted to thank the select board for their past and continued support of Chandler Music Hall, and I wanted to remind folks about the event happening in um, on Saturday in honor of the Herald. So thank you for all of that. Okay, Amy. Um, I have a request about the order of the agenda this evening. Um, I would like to ask the select board to consider moving comments from Kimball Public Library before the discussion of the historic preservation easements. So swapping the order of 5G and 5H. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're on the agenda. Talk right. right. We are on the agenda. Okay. I put, I'll shut up. Go ahead. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. And then I got one more. Yeah, I just did see it on the agenda. I don't believe, but I'm curious uh, where the select board is as far as um, putting the townwide police force on the agenda for this coming uh, election. I think we're very early on the budget preparation side, but um, I don't think we've made any progress in getting to a townwide police force versus a district at this point. Okay. Any other public comment? Um, um, yeah, we'll skip over it and get these done and then go back to the okay. control board because it's a pretty basic one. Um, uh, I have public comment from Zoom. Yep, go ahead. Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, it's on the same topic of the police. I saw that in the last uh, select board meeting minutes, uh, we appropriated funds for two new police cruisers. Um, and since, since it's before budgeting, I thought uh, I wanted to tell you all that I went through all of the data from the police July to July uh, data dump on the website. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I think it's well outside the scope of like a single public comment, but I did hope to like kick off the conversation. I thought now was a good time with that money spent and with budgeting probably coming up. Um, but just like really quick highlights. Um, there's a year of data. I think if you go through the police committee minutes from the last year and compare what we wanted the police force for with what they're actually doing. I think there's a pretty wide discrepancy there. Uh, so I I hope to get an opportunity maybe to put that on the agenda in a future meeting uh, or talk to some of you, whoever's interested. Uh, I can also share the spreadsheet with anyone who'd like that. Thank you. Anyone else on the public comment? All right. Um, move down to approval of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Before you go, did you, were you going to make a yeah, swap yeah. through or? Sounds like a good idea. It would just be approved as modified and just flip the order. Yeah. I'm fine with it. They're two different topics, but they're related. Okay. I don't think it matters the order. Okay, I move with the. Um, changes that we posted. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Consent calendar, meeting minutes and warrants. I move to approve meeting minutes and warrants. That's pretty good. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And to the business agenda. Consider a water wastewater allocation request for two locations. 
Chris is here, live and in Chris. person. Welcome. Walk you through both. Yeah. Um, yes, we'll just start. 22 North Main Street um, The is being sold and contingent upon the sale as it needs approvals for the uh, companies coming in they want to turn into a hostel. So they're looking to increase the allocation. Um, the water increase would be 1,080 gallons per day. Wastewater would be 1,340 gallons per day. Total allocation fee between two would be $6,700 to the water and sewer departments. Um, and then the other one is 45 Water Street, which is a little street right across from the college, so down on the bank. Um, Upper Valley Services has purchased that property. Uh, yeah, that property. And they're looking to convert the single family home into a two resident for disabled. Uh, and they're looking to increase mm -hmm. just the wastewater increase of 560 gallons per day, which would be $2,900. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Um, what's the piece request? They're reasonable, they are they have capacity in the system. So it's one of those. Motion to approve both request. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Water wastewater request for an expenditure to rebuild the centrifuge. So in September, we had. Um, GA was valued with what our centrifuge is. They came up and serviced the machine, um, did what they call a minor service, which is basic belts, oil change, and just a general inspection of the internals. And they found that the two big main bearings had damage on them, and they suggested that we you know, get a, do a full overhaul of the machine, which, you know, because to tear the bearings out, they've got to do anyways and get that repaired. Uh, they did our, advise me to monitor the vibrations. Um, they have vibration sensors on it. They are within spec still, so we are not at the point where it's a danger, but they said it's not, the life expectancy is not very long on it. Chris, can you tell us what, the, what this machine does and why we have it? So this machine is, the, is what does the dewatering. So in the process of the wastewater, most all your wastewater plants have to do this, is the sludge is pulled out of the system and it, regulating that sludge amount in the system is how you process your wastewater. Well, you gotta do something with the byproduct, which is the sludge, um, the excess sludge. So we dewater it to put it into like what they call sludge cake, which then gets hauled off the landfill. And this machine is what performs that duty. So this is a sizable machine. Yes. 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 Let me tell you, do the other part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in another conversation that happens to build, um, there's a couple projects that are being looked at by some students to look at whether that's the right answer, the centrifuge versus a uh, a screw press is screw one press. option, a rotating press is another option. Different forms of solids, sludge dewater. Um, centrifuges tend to be the most expensive option on the market. They do get your solids percentage a little bit better than the rest. However, the intensive costs, I mean, we're talking, we're looking at 32, or $33,000, which is, just a little bit under a quarter of the cost of, for example, a screw press, uh, a full new machine. And uh, for example, because I had an extensive conversation with Rob Dimick about the cost of one. And uh, he's putting one in that would be about the right size for us is about 150, 160,000 in total. Uh, this is not the first major expense we've had on this machine uh, in 2018. The gearbox blew apart when the machine was only three, four years old. Um, that was fifty thousand dollars for just the part, um, not never mind the eight to ten thousand dollars for the technician to come and install it. It's all specialized equipment, specialized tools. It's hard for us to maintain and operate it when it's damaged. 
works great when it's working, but when it's got a problem, we're not equipped to fix it. So we have a couple of options here that Chris and Trevor can sort through to get the best one, but one of the options is to do this rebuild. It's good for a few years. We'll have to do it again or look at whether this press is the way to go. And uh, Rob Dimmick has offered to meet with Chris, see if they can figure out a way to make that work. Um, my understanding is less, less maintenance, less operating costs, works better with your timing as far as it can run while they're there. And now you all know exactly the extent of my understanding of the operations <laughs> of the sewer plan. So, <laughs> well, so, so should we just, be, like, just put this on the back burner until we get some more information then? Or? So I think that, that it's a management call, which way to go with it. And we ought to approve them to go up to a certain dollar amount tonight if they can. If they got to have more than that, they can come back and and have that conversation. The money's coming out of the capital reserve fund. There's a wastewater for, the, for these type of things, yeah. Um, so it's there, I mean, I would be comfortable approving them to move forward with the best option after they explore it and, and do their process and, and it, cap them at like 50,000. Okay, so. Well, on, I'm sorry, how much? On, yeah, 50000 on what they could do. Is there any, an alternative one that might cost a little bit more or something like that? So it's in the wiggle room just to kind of move forward? It could yeah. be that we could do one of the other press options for less than the centrifuge and then pair it with one of the, there's a UV yeah, there are component that could be layered in too, and those both might fit in that footprint and provide for that similar, longer lasting one easier operation or at least reduce streamline more efficient but it's quite an operating savings too Thank you. On, a, on an annual oh, basis yes. so they there's an inspection process of that right that takes place or are we telling me they come every year to look at it oh for the centrifuge it's every one to two years for telling your apologies and that's yeah quite a chunk of change yes that was well that's what found it that was Right around nine thousand dollars <throat> to have them come up and do just a basic oil change, <clears throat> belt change, and inspect all the internals and give us a, a life. It would be a savings because you wouldn't have that yeah. going forward. I mean, it's quite a. My understanding is the operations are there will be a savings on that side too mm -hmm. on some of the functional part, but I think it's worth exploring whether that. Yeah, but I, I thought Chris what just said that the that a new machine. A different machine would be more like 150000 If we were to buy it outright. There is a possibility of a lease agreement as well. Um, Rob is, I guess, this one that he's putting in Pennsylvania is actually on a rental, even, not even a lease type deal. You know, they're, they're renting it to this company, to this place for a little while to see if it's the right size for what they want. And there's a whole thing with it. So he's explaining it all to me. Is there, a, is there a chance that you might get more information and decide that it really just makes sense for us to go out and buy our own in the short term to just get it done? I suppose theoretically. And it would have to come back here. Yeah. Because they're going to go spend 150000 or something, then it would have to come back. So we could we could move to spend up to like $50,000 mm -hmm. and, and then, but they could also say, actually, that's not the option we want. Come back here, and then we could yeah. approve. Approve, or I suppose, I suppose not approve a larger request. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, because it least kind of be gives them a, a dollar value to take some action before yep. no, the, like a it. month is up. I just want to make sure I understand where we're at. Let's see where. Because we also have to stack them out if for some reason there's uh, supply chain issues, other retrofit types of issues. There might be a better long term one we need authorization for, but we still have to work with centrifuge in the intervening two years or whatever it is. <coughs> so it provides the ability to be fixed now if we have to, too, while we talk. So it gives us a broad array of ways to go. But with some guardrails to make sure we don't sell it. And <laughs> yeah. it like Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
I motion to approve up to fifty thousand dollars for the fix. Might, it might not be centrifuge anymore. Maybe something different. Yep. For repairs or replacement, would make the most sense from the efficiency and operating needs and cost. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. American Legion request for the hometown hero banners. Mm -hmm. Is that you? Do you people have information on this program? We do. Mm -hmm. I see them when I drive through Williamstown. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. We got those in our packet. Oh, you do have these? Yep. Okay. Yep. Anybody else want some general info? Sure. Thank you. Thanks. What we're looking to do is put banners with the photographs and military history and sponsors. The banners would be uh, 18 by 48. I went through town and counted approximately 75 with light poles and have double crossbars. So we could put banners on both sides. I counted another 25 to 30 that do not have crossbars. But with a simple bracket, we can put crossbars on them. These can be bolted to the poles or they can be put on a band clamps. I would Myself would prefer to have just, you got to drill and tap a few holes. I own a machine shop. I'm semi-retired, so I'd be more than happy to volunteer my time to help the town crew put these up if, if we need them. <clears throat> like I said, we have enough holes right now to support 200 plus banners. We're shooting for 100 banners first year. This is going to be an ongoing program to support the veterans in the town. I did a check on the amount of veterans in the area through the Legion roster and VFW roster, and I come up with 118. I'm going to guess it's probably closer to 200 because we don't have membership of all the veterans in this area. And this program goes back to World War I. So we could have quite a few. As far as placing more banners over a period of time, going around town and looking at all the businesses, a lot of the businesses have light poles on their properties that would support the banners. I go up to uh, Paul Ray's hotel up there. They've got poles up there with support banners. So there's lots of room for all the veterans that we want to support. As far as financing goes, I'm trying to do this with no expense to the town. I've got flyers made up, and these flyers will go around to all the businesses. And to have the businesses support the program. A lot of the businesses have veterans in their employ. They would be happy to get support. The banner cost is $200. It's $100 for a replacement banner if the banner gets damaged, destroyed, they last about three to four years. So we get quite a bit of longevity out of that $200. Like I said, the replacement is $100. The time frame, I'm going to put these, uh, the second page of the flyer out to businesses all around the community. Get some feedback as to who would support it. And depending on the feedback we get, January 1st, we're looking for uh, initially these places. Once we have the pledges in, after January 1st, we recontact everyone to go ahead and start the program up. Start taking information from the veterans, veterans' photos, and the funds. Um, I'm looking for the town's approval to put banners on the polls. This would, this would be in addition to not to replace the flags at the American Legion as on the party flags. Yeah. We designed it so we think the arms would be lower and the flag wouldn't interfere with it. And we leave uh, 
There are a number of polls in the main part of the town where you have uh, banners up for 4th of July, Memorial Day. We leave one side of the poll empty. Because most of the polls in town going down Main Street, the 75 plus polls there, you've got crossbars that are on both sides. Because there's plenty of room to have Metro banner up and have an empty side on the other side for Memorial Day, 4th of July banners, anything else that's going on, you know, for advertisement. I think in front of Chandler, we, we eliminated those because Chandler has must have. Yes, yeah, Chandler has quite a bit of stuff they want to put up. So we skip right there in that area and whatnot. As far as mounting the banners, uh, they have the banners are heavy vinyl. They come with a loop top and bottom. On the interior side, there's a grommet top and bottom, so they can actually anchor to the pole. Or if you're going to do double banners, you can go through and anchor the banners to each other. So it wouldn't be necessary to have the end cap or finial on the rods. So the banners could be anchored to the pole with no anything else. So is the request to have these hanging year round? <coughs> Pardon me? You're, you're asking to hang these year round? The banners would go up probably the week before Memor uh, Memorial Day. They come down the week after Veterans Day. So it's just during the summertime. Same as the street flags. We try to put them up before yes, where yeah. they take they, them down. You know, basically, do it in conjunction with putting the flags up. Do we own 75 poles? Or are some of these like power poles? And no, we're, those are the those street types. Well, we've got lots of black street light poles that are all over town. Well, okay. Main Street, but we also have some on side streets. So you're going down all the South Pleasant, Merchants Row, Salisbury Street, Salisbury over by the uh, Carl Depot. Like I said, there's approximately 75 that are counted double crossbars but another 25 to 30 that have no crossbars at all. Like the ones on the bridge are flags only, those don't have any crossbars on. But for the initial uh, offering of the 100 banners for 100 veterans, initially we wouldn't need to do anything other than put crossbars up on the existing poles. And you're looking for this approval to be for three to four years? Um, that what you said? That we would like it long term, indefinitely. But I think as long as we've got flags up there and, and we want to support our veterans, I, the the initial uh, what what we're saying is the initial vinyls have a projected life of three to four summers. So yeah, and and we would. Hope that it would be an ongoing program where people would honor their relatives or businesses or honor their employees by purchasing new ones as we go along and rotate we'll through. And if the town feels that 150 or 200 banners all over town and whatnot is a little bit much, what we could do is do the first 100 batch that we're going to do for 25. And then the uh, banners that we collect during 25 to go up in 26, 25 will be taken down, marked, put up a new a set in the next year, just cycle them back again. Which is, I mean, that's something we could address depending on quantity. I have no idea at this time how many veterans, you've got people that may not want to have their veteran up there. I have no idea what the response will be. If the indications uh, if the indication of the amount of people that showed up last December for the reef laying ceremony, I went up there about a half hour late. There was no place to park. The cars were lined on the park. Main Street, all the way down to the cemetery. I think they had over 500 <clears throat> volunteers up there. So if that's any indication of the support the veterans have in this area, I think we'd have quite a few. I love driving through Williamstown and seeing them up yeah. on the poles. Williamstown has them. Uh, Bennington has them. Bennington has them. Yeah, it's it's awesome to see yeah. it. 
I totally support our veterans, and I, I think we, we need to honor them whenever we can. I, this concerns me because we'd be having a private organization um, really engaging in political speech, and if we do that, we're opening ourselves up to letting really any organization that wants to do something similar to have to share that space. And we're getting, we get into a huge can of worms. We had this conversation at the schools not too long ago when the school wanted to put up a Black Lives Matter flag and did for a while, but then ended up taking it down because of this same issue where they felt like they were going to be forced to have to share that space with anybody who asked for it and really didn't want to get into that kind of controversy. I think we were going to be in the same exact situation here. And I'd really rather not have to. How is your warning of veteran political speech? I think it's two totally different things. I think veterans and political preference is very different. I, I think if you those, those, those veterans, veterans are the ones that fought and died and bled I, for the I, very I, political I, speech that I, you're talking about. I, I hear you. I think that if we do this, we're going to be getting requests from all sorts of groups to do this, and we're not going to be able to say no. We're not. We're going to open a can of worms that we can't close. I understand what you're saying, Larry. I was on the hospital board during uh, the Floyd thing, the Black Lives Matter, and we had been requested to put a flag up. And I opposed that because it would open the door for all kinds of flags being put up. And I said, before we do that, we have to have criteria, specific criteria, what supports, what is it? That's very much political speech. I don't think I can agree with you that putting hometown hero veteran banners on the street poles is any more political speech than what the VFW, the Rotary, and the Legion did after 2009-11, putting the street flags up. You know, that was, uh, I think, quite different from political speech and as a veteran, I think honoring veterans is quite different from political speech. In all the VFW Legion meetings I have been to, politics is one thing that never, ever comes up. And you've got veterans there, they're independents, they're Republicans, they're Democrats. In all of our meetings, that's something that's never, ever discussed. It's not necessarily taboo. People joke around about the general information that's going around every day. But it's to sit down and, and have a, a uh, discussion about a serious discussion about politics and reading. Never heard of it. And I've been in the Legion Post here since 2005. Okay, we have another. And past commander. Yeah, we got it's somebody. never, ever came up. Ever. Okay, hang on. Amy? Um, I just took a quick look at the town website and it looks like the town does have a sign ordinance that perhaps would be useful to guide your discussion or decision. Did you look into the sign ordinance? I'm wondering if maybe the pledge, because I know there's a price tag on the sign ordinance, maybe you could look into that, the price of the pledge could go towards that. I don't know how long you can have a sign up if you request. Well, we don't. Um... Well, they're split. The banners are split between two, two different types. There's the event one, and then there's yeah. the um, decoration one. So these would be considered the decoration so that you're not pinned in by the oranges, have gotcha. some timelines tied to the event, so you'd be under the decorative banner framework, which puts the decision in your hands mm -hmm. as to whether or not to let them up. Um, and the ones that are private property wouldn't be anything to do with us, correct? Or, or would that be approved because it's a sign? Right. So decoration. It's a, all right, so if someone... And there are allowances for up to two, I think it's, I can go back to that section, but there are allowances in there for signs on the private property aspect. Right. So we're approving that if someone privately wanted to have an extra sign up. Well, these would be for those public poles, basically, the non-private ones. Right. So, so these would be decorative banners on the poles that remain, basically, once you take the private or any of the other, you know, Chandler restricted area ones out, or the ones that are being held for Chandler. Right. Copies allowed one two-sided banner that's full mounted and does not exceed 10 square feet per side. 
doesn't exceed 10. Well, that's for the, the two sided banner and pullman. When you get down below that, that's the banners on the downtown light post banner arms, which is the style we're talking about here. And that's where you get into these would be decorative and not event based, presumably, unless you made another determination, I guess, because those have a time element if they're event based. So all banners, whether to advertise an event or for decoration, shall receive permission by the select board prior to installation. Such permission shall be granted if the design of the banners is not offensive to common sensibilities and meets all applicable requirements of this ordinance. I'll double check, but I don't believe we define common sensibilities. So these are only six square feet, right? 1.5 times four. Right, 18's 1.5. Yeah, 1.5. Oh, you're the math guy. <laughs> 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 okay. I was doing the square. <laughs> 18 by 48 size. Hometown Heroes program offers a number of different sizes. They will do custom sizes. No, I was just saying. 1836. No, I'm just saying if somebody has a concern about the size, 18 by 48 size, their standard 48 is a 24 by 48. I talked to Jason about doing an 18. He's a two foot by four foot makes for quite a sale on the pole mm -hmm. if you get a lot of heavy wind. That's why I figured if we go down to an 18 inch, we could go down to an 18 by 36. It'll be simple to do a. Uh, Coat hanger type extension to anchor to the lower pole. Yeah. So if size is a concern, that could be also dealt with easily. I don't think it is. I was just, uh, he said it had to be under 10 feet, 10 square feet. <laughs> That's all I was checking. Do we know if they're all in good condition, all our posts or anything? Or where they're at? Or do I hang them year around anyways? And then we have the, in the middle of that time frame, we also have the 4th of July. They're going to leave one side of the post right, open okay. for those type of flags. Take all the, take one side of the ones in the downtown area, except by chance. Yeah, you could, you could, it would be in the town's discretion as to where we put them up. Like I said, we could, it's, it's easy enough to, to leave the poles bare where you need up for advertising for town events. Well, you talked about that already, right? One side of the pole in the yeah. downtown and nothing in front of Chandler. I don't know that there's any yeah. others that we, I haven't ever seen a request on any of the others. In terms of the number of them, I just logistically, so who all puts them up and takes them down and then um, what does that, I just want to make sure there's no like, I mean, one sign is different than 100 or 200 signs um, in terms of, like, who's going up onto the pole, putting them up, installing them, making sure they're secure. Well, when the Legion did the street flags, originally we were putting them up, but we worked with the town, and the town thought maybe it'd be a little wiser to, instead of having the old men clambering up the street poles, to, the town crew does the street flags, put them up <coughs> and take them down for us. And we were hoping that that would be part of our discussion with the town as we go forward. But if not, uh, certainly some volunteers from the Legion would put them up and take them down, uh, working with the town yes. on time and manner. As regards to storage of the banners, they'd be stored by the Legion. And taken down the fall, we clean them and store them and have them ready for the next spring. Same as we do with the flags. This, this feels really different to me than the flags. I, I really feel like this is we're gonna, that we are putting, we're going to be putting ourselves in a position where we're going to be constantly deciding what kind of private banners we're going to be putting up and what kinds we're not. And I don't think we really want to be in that position over any long period of time at all, or even a short period of time. We have too much other important work to do without getting embroiled in these kinds of disputes. And I think that's what we're, where we're going to be headed. What type of, like, recognizing somebody from the town? Are you thinking, like, people will come forward and want to recognize something for some 
something we people don't like. Up, well, people might want to put up all sorts of things, and we're not going to be able to tell them no because we allow other people to do it. And if we want to manage that process somehow, we're going to, we already have town staff maxed out on all sorts of issues, and I don't think we should be adding to their burden of just having to just manage a whole other process. Um, so we allow decided. certain events to go on the polls. Should we not be allowing that because other events that people don't support might want to take that space? I think this is a, a really different thing. If you're talking about an event that's, a, that's short term and it happens once and then it's done, that's one thing. This is a multi-year project and beyond. So it's a very different set of criteria here. So you're thinking that honoring one group of people on the it's, polls it's not, for it's that, not so it might of, be another group that we don't want to? It's not, it's not so much a matter of to. honoring anybody. It's a matter of... The shower be, was training slowly today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's more soon. a matter of... Mm -hmm. There you go. We're, we're, we're giving a, a private organization pu public space to express an idea. It's not a bad idea, it's a good idea. But if we do that, then we're going to have to give other groups the same opportunity to use our public space. We're not going to be able to discriminate. And I think we're going to end up in a big, in a big can of worms. I'm not sure that we want to open that can. I don't think supporting veterans is an idea. I think it's honoring veterans. Um, my husband is a veteran, and I think this would be an amazing thing to support the veterans and the families of veterans. I don't think this is an idea. I don't think we're going to get into a political argument. I, and it's so different from other private groups. I, I, don't, I think the things you are worried about aren't necessarily something that's so big. I mean, and they are going to put the banner, well, they said that if the town can't, they would have volunteers we'll to put the banners up, take them down, clean them. It doesn't really sound like there's a lot that the town might have to do. When we first put the flags up in town, it was the American Legion, the VFW. They came down there with our ladders and our time and our screwdrivers and put all the brackets up and put all the flags up. And I'm sure there's a lot of veteran families who would volunteer to help. Yes. You and I are going to respectfully disagree on the political speech argument, and that's fine. It's what we do. But I'm wondering if it would be helpful to you if somehow we made a poll of Williamstown, of Bennington, Whitehall, New York, and other areas that have had these hometown hero programs for an extended length of time to see if there's ever been any inquiries or questions with regard to the program. I mean, I, I know that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't take away your theoretical basis, but I'm saying with the practical application, is the theory that strong? And I would kind of back Larry a little bit. I think it's less political, but it's just the idea of um, if we let the banners go up for this, and then and what happens if the school wants to put up the banners for the seniors, and then we have this, and then we have that. And like our ordinance is just kind of a little bit so then what happens if next summer somebody wants to take half the summer to do something different that's not what you guys are doing and we gave you guys the full summer this year like how do we kind of decide which banners go up at which point I guess is I kind of see a little bit of that argument there of just um, of where once we start, when do we stop putting bands? I think veterans are a unique group. I agree. I agree 100%. Unto themselves. Yeah, 100%. I do. I, I believe that 100% too. Um, but what happens if next year the school wants to do something and you guys already have banners up and, you know, um, and what, what point do we decide who gets what precedent? Well, I think you I said I know you could in office. <laughs> I think. Um, it, it, that, that problem might exist, but if we had a big four-year banner, 
I would think that a statement to the school or whoever would be released, we only have a limited number of spaces and we have, that's a four year agreement for those banners or a three year agreement. I, I'm really questioning whether we can get a four year bylaw out of in Vermont weather, but that's what the company says. Uh, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm just wondering whether the, the uh, common sensibilities and the common sense uh, might suggest that uh, we'll just see if the Williamstown, a Bennington, a Whitehall, a, a puts, puts the one in New Jersey, see if any of those places yeah. have ever had any inquiry or question about it. Well, I, I wonder if the fact that you can only point to so few examples of this means that a lot of communities have already decided this is not something they want to be involved in. Or not many communities have had a proposal yet. Now, I, I can only point to get back to HGH. I can only point to organization and find out how many towns they're doing these of these. So I think you're going to find it's going to be thousands. Um, I would like to see a map of where the poles would be too, and how many poles and what condition they're in to make sure that the first safety issues too would be one concern for me. Um, I don't think that we have any. Probably any inventory. We are the ones with the Fourth of July ones go on, but that's one side. Yeah. It, Some it, of those posts were missing at one point, weren't they? Oh, the banner arms. Yeah. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I couldn't say what the banner arm conditions are. But I don't know that we have to. Like, if you're going to prove this, you would allow them to put them on the banner arms that are Those's in good condition. Have. Yeah. Like, it is what it is. I don't. I don't know that we're certifying the condition of the. Or, or, you know, saying, yeah, there's 75 poles and they're all in good shape and can hold your banners. I think they take some of that risk when they when they do that piece. And There is a number of poles that would need to have new banner arms put up or crossbars replaced. Mm -hmm. Not there, aren't many, there aren't many poles, oh. the, the poles going down to Main Street that have both crossbars on them. I, it sounds Name to for the me record. like there's, there's a place, there's some places here where you have, um, there's some diving that needs to be done. One would be how many times had in recent history, or at least since the polls were available with the bars on them, had people asked to use them. Um, you know, if it, if it comes up a lot where there are groups that ask to use that kind of a public display, then that raises a different kind of concern than if nobody's ever asked this question before, right? Well, the areas that people use, they've already said they won't put them there. Yeah. So, so, and then to find out whether there have been conflicts in the places that have the polls and maybe some numbers about how many, you know, how many requests there are, you know, how many towns, how many towns do this. I, I, I'm kind of siding with the veterans here, you know, I, th I think that honoring our veterans is a really important piece of what we do as a community. And I don't know that it poses, for me, it doesn't pose any, any free speech kind of a conflict. Um, but, but I think, it, and I also think a dive perhaps into the logistics of the sign ordinance and the way it's written and what's permitted might might make sense you know it, it sounds to me like you just need to know more you know or or that some of you need to know more before you make a decision i think we already went through the sign ordinance so we have that information yeah yeah so we've already learned that but once you start doing stuff like this then there are going to be other requests mm -hmm. and so and, and then i kind of that's when the can of worms could open and we could all of a sudden just be Deciding which yeah. like school play we were putting up for, what's this and what's that, and conditions um, of the post, and so the, the ordinance see. allows for town supported events, yeah. and I think what we got into with some conversations when they wanted to do something for the school was that the school is part of the town, and right. so we allowed the school and the town stuff, and that's what we allow. I think where it, what we haven't allowed is somebody to advertise their yard sale on the right. on the polls or those type of like completely private pieces but i think there's also an argument there that the veterans aren't private yeah and they're not a, a single focused piece right they 
it would be interesting to understand from an attorney or a prior one is there any um, is there any practice or any case law on them being looked at as a, as a group like we see them as a group in a lot well, of places I, I, but are they if a I tried to use that I'd have a real conflict of interest wouldn't I sound like a true lawyer <laughs> <laughs> aren't they, aren't they uh, but aren't veterans a public group? Like the military is a public I don't know that I've ever seen anything one way or the other. Is that either. question? Thanks for the help. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a private group that's coming to us with this request. It's a national organization. Well, we're, we're, we're 501 C19, which is a public organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, it's not it's a private. That doesn't, that doesn't make, makes you a nonprofit. Doesn't make you a public organization. Well, it's it is the 501 C19. I'm going to get into this a little bit now. Okay. Federal ID numbers issued to the national organization and all of the chapters beneath are public organizations under that same federal ID number. I know I'm mixing I'm mixing private public corporations with with uh, federal tax law, but uh, we we are, we consider ourselves I mean, a public the organization. The town is a public organization, but like Clara Martin, supported by tax dollars in a lot of cases, it's still a private organization. It's not a public organization. Um, it's a nonprofit. It's still not a public organization. It's a private organization, right? I would really disagree with you. Well, I I can't. Say anything definitive about what Claire Martin's Yeah, I'm just using them is. as an example. I, I don't there's know their charter. There's lots of others. Now, our charter is is a, a national charter for with all under the same federal ID number as. And, and now I I cannot definitively say there is a legal opinion out there, but it calls itself a public organization. <coughs> In my mind, it's pretty clear that I think the real, I mean, for the, the point for me there is really just, it's a membership base, right? So even you, when you were presenting, said you know of 118 members, but there might be more. So then, I mean, yeah, right? So how do you decide? So only American Legion members are the heroes that we're, like, have for any the, well, well, any, any any that's veteran that any country you want to sponsor, we think is eligible to be up there. Yeah. I only refer to Legion and VFW in regards to quantity for membership, or how many veterans initially we might have banners for. This is right. for I'm any veteran. Out, it's, but it's a membership org organization, yes. so some people choose to be a member. Yes. And those are the, in the American Legion, Legion, yes. Yes. But there's other veterans that we might want to honor as well as we choose to honor them. Yes. So it's, it, it is a membership organization. It's not a representing every single, there's not like a list of every single veteran. It's I, I, I need you to understand. I think you've got an accurate yeah. version. Yeah. Yeah. The Legion is a membership organization. The program would right. be available to any veteran, regardless yeah. of whether they belong to any organization. Yeah, I, I just think, I mean, if I give you, I mean, it will, I think it's going to be a lot of work to figure out who all is going to be participating and who's paying for what. I mean, it sounds like a $20,000 prop, you said 200 per, you know, so it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> if that's the support you want, I don't know. I guess we can, um, I don't know, Trini, what do you want to do about, like, Well, the question they're asking just is, would the town allow them to use the polls? That's the only question before us. There's no question about finances or any of that and then there was the question about whether any of the town crew would be available potentially when they're ready to install them or take them down for the winter months those are the two asks I heard when we typically do the banner that like goes across the street there's usually an insurance part of it too right in case anything happens there 
Is that something we, that we want haven't to done those for years. Right. Because, because we kept the, taking out parts of the buildings. Right. <laughs> but um, would that be a similar thing, though, that we would ask, like, if something failed and there was... We don't require them on any of the others, but the others aren't there for that length of time. Right. Because over the whole entire summer, if something failed and it fell on somebody or something, would that be something we want to request? Or is that something I don't see a banner really pulling down on arm of a light post. It's definitely Some of those posts are pretty, yeah, like the arms. They're not stuff. spring chickens. They're no, not, and some of them are bent, and you can see the paint <laughs> chipping off some of them. I'm talking about like that, like if it's not properly secured, no, and yeah. one of those comes down, like the insurance thing, maybe. How was that different from the flags? Um, I don't know. That, that was just a question I was asking. I wasn't, I was just asking if there's something else we want to consider. The ordinance to, makes the separating to the vendors across the street is required in the ordinance that the certificate of insurance is part of the deal there. And we haven't historically for any of the, whether it be event specific or flags or any of that, we haven't, okay. right down to the flowers didn't require. It okay. wasn't, um, doesn't mean we couldn't, just we haven't, and it's not baked into that ordinance yet, or at this time, I should say. Um. We could toss the question to the town attorney if you wanted to ask the question of whether this is opening a can of worms. There's no hurry on this issue as far as I'm concerned. If you folks want to chew on it some more, mm -hmm. I can come back next meeting. I'm not in any hurry. Christmas time. <laughs> come for December. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would be interested in hearing just what the shape that they're in and what we might have to do to make sure that we could put the banners up too. Get the arms and all that stuff, like what the cost might be. Because that would be something that we, if we decide to do it, we might throw that financial burden over. I don't think it's the town's job. Right. To make well, sure the arms are there and they're, you know, in that right. type of shape. Like what they're asking for is permission. I would imagine if there's no arms on one of the poles, the, they would move to the next pole. Well, the director. Last week, and he said they've got arms. He thinks they've got arms for all of the poles that will accept them. He was going to have to check and see. Who did you speak with? Um, Randolph? He, he talked yeah. to Harold. Harold. Yeah. 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 So you could inspect the poles, and they may not be there for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Harold's got them in the back room. <laughs> um, cool. Well, then let's table this and come back to it next month, if that's okay. Well, I think we've got to, like, what do you want to do? Because just tabling it for a month isn't going to get us anywhere. Right. Like, do we want to ask Trevor to put the question to the town attorney? Or do you want to look at some of the other towns and what they got for information and how they got through the process? Yes. So I'll get in touch with my cousin. In New York State, where my banner's up in my hometown, they've had banners up there for over eight years. And I'll see if they had any problem with this. She was the mayor there for 10 years. And see if they had any problem with this sort of thing. So, um, who would like to follow up with Williamstown and who would like to follow up with Bennington? I can check in with Williamstown. See what they, if they had that issue. Anybody want to call Bennington? Gee, you and I could get in touch with the Legion Post. Hang on here. And then we can, you want to do the town attorney? Sure. Ask him what we're getting into, and then we can hash it out some more. Great. Does that work? Love it. Does that so work? you're not requesting us to bring back that sort of information? Nope. Okay. So I was going to say we could get a hold of the Legion Post in those towns. Yep. Get some information from them. West Rutland also has them. Yeah. Right all New York. We don't want to do New York because they're different. Different states. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I clarified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not hanging those flags. <laughs> no, they just have different laws, different rules. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your time. All right.
preferred siting designation for the Beanville Road. I'm Kevin McAllister, Kevin on Solar. You guys didn't get site plans, I think, in your. We did not. Yeah, yeah. 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 Jerry Ward to identify possible community solar sites in uh, the greater Randolph area. We looked at approximately eight different sites. Um, finally settled on this one as being the most buildable and um, conceivably most acceptable uh, site to put 150 AW in a solar array. Uh, this will be a community solar site so that. Uh, it will be cooperatively owned and managed by the participants, the off-takers of the power. Uh, 150 kW will potentially provide um, enough solar for about 25 households in the area. Um, we've done this uh, to be the third that we've developed, I think, in the last 10 years. There's one on South Randolph Road. Um, on uh, uh, Carl Randall's Carl <coughs> land. Um, we did one in South Royalton. We did another one in uh, Stratford. Community solar provides an opportunity for people that uh, don't have good solar access at their homes to be able to participate in, in that metering and, and get solar power to uh, cover the cost of their electric bill. This site is on uh, Mamorowski's land on uh, Bingo Road. Um, the 150 kW takes up less than an acre of this property. It's at the back of uh, what is mostly sort of scrubby pasture land. I think he pastures his uh, neighbor's oxen there. Um, there will be a short line extension that goes um, from Beano Road to about 100 feet from the array site to the new, new utility pole and transformer. Um, We're seeking, we're asking the select board to sign a joint letter of support calling this a preferred site under the uh, 5.100 net metering rule with the Public Utilities Commission. Um, sites uh, that are um, distributing their power off site um, kind of require. You don't require it, but you, you lose a significant amount of the value of the power unless it can be considered a preferred site under the uh, PC rule. Uh, preferred sites, site is automatically preferred if the power is staying on the site, or if it's a disturbed site, such as a gravel pit or quarry uh, site, uh, ground fields. Um, if your site is none of those things, you can attain preferred siting status by getting a joint letter of support from the Town Planning Commission, the Select Board, and the Regional Planning Commission. We went before the Randolph Planning Commission about three weeks ago. Um, they agreed to sign this letter. I believe that Jeff Brown drafted the letter. That may have been in your packet, I'm not sure. Um, and so we're, we're similarly asking the uh, select board to send this letter so that we can take it to the Regional Planning Commission for signature. Um, the opportunity to do these projects is very time limited at this point. Uh, the rules have changed. Um, Off-site group net metering is going away after December 31st. So. Um, unfortunately, community solar is, this is kind of the last opportunity to do a community solar project in, unless they change the rules again. Uh, so we're hoping to get our full application in to the PUC by mid-December at this point. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions? 
questions from the board? I assume we adjusted the letter so it, we don't end up in the East Bethel situation. <laughs> Hopefully no slopes, so yep. it's good. <laughs> no slopes. <laughs> we should not be in Davis Road. Repeat. Should not. Should not. I would. But we are into first for you, so. Common sensibilities would dictate that we don't get a chance This This is exactly the kind of project that we want to see. I mean, if, if we wouldn't approve this as a preferred site, it's hard to imagine where we would possibly put it. Davis Road. Right? <laughs> Do we have anybody here on this project? <clears throat> no public comment? Not seeing anybody take their mute button off. Anybody want to take a motion on this? Anybody else wants to? I'll, I'll move that we. Um, uh, approve the uh, preferred siting letter for this for this project on the Road. Second. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Does anybody have that letter? Yep. I didn't print it. Yes. We do. Right Thank there. You. Just so we sign it tonight. And just, yeah, just a point of information so you know from the prior stones of these. Do you send it to the to River Dotic Week Team Report Commission or do, do we? Oh, we'll, we'll take it, Jim. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. 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 Do we have any reason to have a copy of this? I, we, no. I guess if it's not fully executed, it wouldn't hurt to have a scan of it real quick and then mm -hmm. at a minimum. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is RACD letter of attestation for downtown vibrancy fund grant. We have Erica here. I, think. I am Eric Robinson, the downtown program manager. Um, I applied for this grant and the state approved it. Um, they want to give us twenty-five thousand dollars in funding for our designated downtown and. In order to get the first disbursement, I need a um, majority of the legislative body to sign this letter of attestation which says, the municipality supports the work that our downtown organization is doing to further de the development and success of our downtown. The municipality understands that the downtown organization will be receiving $25,000 in state funding through the Downtown Vibrancy Fund program to complete projects aligned with the Main Street four-point approach, economic vitality, promotions, design, and organization. The municipality acknowledges and agrees that this funding will supplement and not supplant any funding traditionally provided to the downtown organization by the municipality. The municipality acknowledges that the Department of Housing and Community Development will review the municipality's allocation to the downtown organization annually and may take any change in the allocation into future downtown vibrancy fund program awards. And so I just Humbly asking for your signatures on this letter of attestation so we can get this funding. So is the the supplement versus supplant, is that for this year's budget? Um, the FY25, is that what that is for? Because yeah, it, uh, we don't have a budget yet for 26. So. Yeah, so it's, um, it, I applied in July and they granted it in August. And I had submitted this letter to be signed by you guys in September, but it's, you know, many other things are going on, so we are here now. Um, you know, or, ordinarily it would be for this for this current fiscal year. So it's FY25? Yeah. 
I don't know if you guys have this in your packet. They, they do. Yep. What does this require of us? Is it just a pretty simple passer, or is this uh, something we're going to have to put admin time into? I don't think it's not coming to the town, right? We're not it's signing not. that this is coming to us. It's no, just it that we know you applied for it. comes to RACBC, we're like the, the signing organization, and then I just yes. you know, set the goals that the state approved for the use of these funds and have plans for all the money according to their four-point goals. So this is not a pass-through grant? It's not a pass-through. It oh. goes directly to RACDC. What they're saying, they want us to sign that we know they're getting it and that the town is going to continue to put funding in also. We're not changing we, our allocation. Which we already have budget for this year anyways, right? Yep. So that's already yeah. so. I was only checking because we haven't done next year's budget. Right. Yeah. So we can there are some that yeah. We got some pretty big decisions to make on that one. So we wouldn't sign if we were guaranteeing next year we had to fund it. Mm -hmm. So do we need a vote then? Do you want to ask what the money's going to be used for? I, I'd What's be curious. Uh, it says in here. Well, I, I mean, it says the four-point okay. approach, but what does that mean in terms of stuff that we're going to see? I can see? give you examples. I, yeah. I brought some examples. Um, for economic vitality, um, we've done a feasibility assessment with architectural consultants on the rehab of a historic downtown building. Um, and that has actually already happened, but this grant would just fund that. Um, promotions, we do um, you know, wayfinding from exit 89, exit, or I-89, exit four to downtown. Um, promotions and marketing for that. We, we're already doing things at like welcome centers around the state, and this funds like some of the design and promotion for that. Um, print and social media ads, promoting downtown Randolph. Um, downtown garden rehab, falls under the design beautification goal. Um, Funding of special downtown events comes under the organization goal. And um, one thing that the state is requiring as part of this this time is a shared marketing goal. And so we have to provide, and I've already been working with local photographers, we have to provide photos, tours and photos to the state that are uniquely Randolph. They go on all the Vermont tourism websites, they do promotion with them, and we come up with like an itinerary of like where a tourist or somebody coming to visit Randolph would go. Um, and that's you know, also funded by this grant. So, all good things for Randolph, and you guys just have to sign a letter. <laughs> and so, how does that work with the 20000 that's in the state budget? The 25000 These are, these so are the what 20, I'm going to the 20000 that the town, the town so it says in. we have, you had, yeah. right? It's the supplement, not the plan. Mm -hmm. And so the 20000 is for events, yeah. And a lot of these same activities. So, so it's how even does more of the things, yeah. Can I stop? Um, I'm Ben Boyle with the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And uh, I would just say actually that this was an initiative that we advocated for in the legislature and have some understanding about it. Uh, it's there's twenty four downtown organizations across Vermont working on economic vitality in their communities. Uh, you know, from our point of view they're chronically underfunded. Uh, see a lot of staff turnover, um, and uh, this was an initiative working with our partners at ACCD to uh, set aside additional funding to support all 24 of the downtown organizations to increase their capacity, to recognize the good work that they're doing and say there's more that could be done in terms of like what that work actually looks like. As you mentioned, it's Main Street Alliance is a national organization of thousands of downtowns and has a four-point program. Uh, around economic vitality and you know, placemaking. And so it all follows uh, a pretty robust program. Um, Gary Holloway uh, is the downtown program director at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, providing technical assistance and support to all of these organizations. I think the key point here is that they went to the legislature and advocated for these additional resources to supplement the funding, not to replace the funding. The idea is to like, grow what they're able to do uh, and so I think you know, what you hear in that letter is a, a potential fear that a town might say, well, the 25000 is coming from the state, so we don't need to fund it anymore. And in fact, I think what would happen is ACCD would say, well, we're actually not going to fund you if you take away um, money that you're already committed to that organization. So just for a point of context, it's, it's part of a whole statewide initiative to help improve our downtown vitality because our downtowns are critical to the economic success of Vermont. 
Okay, but I still have my same question. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm doing a lot of other things, you know, working with all the other downtown organizations, trying to like revive like the multi-org meetups that happen, working with businesses, trying to form some kind of like downtown business membership, um, and other ads like Herald ads, radio ads, other social media ads, like, you know, this is just extra stuff on top of things that have already happened with my predecessor. I have to say, as a downtown business owner, I have noticed a, a really huge increase of actual support from these things. It's really the only organization, well, that's not completely true. Mark's doing a great job. Um, but there's a lot of really great, like, um, like the, um, what was under yes, you yeah. knew what I was going to say. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, a bunch of us actually saw people coming into our businesses because of that. And, uh, and that was something above and beyond what usually happens. So. Yeah, and, and as part of my role as downtown program manager, I'm also working with Mark on you know, downtown vibe stuff and Randolph vibe stuff and have some ideas for promoting the downtown with Randolph vibe and other organizations. Um, I'm working with the I'm on the Chamber of Commerce board now to work with them and try to like bring everyone together because we're all in the same boat here, rowing for Randolph, and we all want it to do well. So, um, I will motion to sign. What's the motion here? To support. Support. The so moved. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank Next you. up uh, is. Do you want to sign right now? That, that would be great if I could walk away with a signed letter so that I can get the check rolling in. <laughs> Um, the you next need time because I could come down tomorrow. No, you just need three. You're good. Need the majority. We got this for you, Alyssa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Clover Hill Road. I don't know that we have any update on Clover Hill Road. I know John went out and looked at it, but he yeah. hasn't really like. That was just kind of a quick tour. Yeah. I don't know how that went. We haven't been able to connect on that. Um, I mean, you could table it for now, too. Um, I don't think we have any choice but to. Well, our adoption policy requires three residents on the road. Is that correct? Uh, well, this would be a reclassification. So this is already a legally trail. established trail. So you have to bring it up to some classification of road. But when you look at practice, statute, okay, policy, state highway aid, you're probably not going to bring something from a legally established trail to a class four road and then plow it. Because we wouldn't touch it. it. So it was going to be a four. Yeah, we don't do that with any other class four road. So you're talking about class three, that's a much larger, grander upgrade, widths, strainage, culverts. Um, we probably also wouldn't dead end it at that point. It does make it eligible for state highway if it becomes a class three, but and loops are easier than dead ends generally to maintain, particularly in the winter. So you want to consider connecting the Fish Hill and Stock Hill. And so now we've got a whole road project and there's a statutory process for reclassification. That you essentially do too. And then you have the policy question of do you, because it's by request, do we handle it like we've handled private roads that want to be considered for adoption and put the onus on those making the request to make those upgrades to our standards and we verify, or that's something we'd end up then putting tax dollars into because that's the source of funds for these kinds of things. So there's embedded in this are those types of. And so, potentially. But right now, it's a private road. Well, it's a town trail, but it's uh, privately maintained in there. goes to a few residents, but we don't own, we own the trail right away, or have a right away for the trail. So we're getting back into where we were a few years ago when we gave up a bunch of roads 
um, in that we don't own the property to do a turnaround and we don't own a safe way for our crews to operate. So this is exactly what we got away from on a lot of segments. It seems like we're... And my understanding is that this would only, right now, would only affect two homes. Two homes and access to the third lot, I think is how it would work out. And, and right now the road is being maintained to those two homes by the current landowners who want access to those land, those properties. It doesn't seem like there's a, a problem to, that, we, that we're solving here by doing anything. I don't know who's responsible for the road upkeep right now. I think it might be somebody who doesn't live on that road that was the requester. I think he's got some responsibility in there, which is some of the reason for the request. But we also don't have two landowners that want it. We have one that's watching it and one that wants it, which is hard to... It seems like the people who are currently doing the maintenance on that road are not requesting that we, we, that, that we relieve them of that burden. I'm not sure why we want to. I'm not sure that they were... I don't think the request came in perfectly clear on who's responsible for the maintenance and the upkeep. I must think Sam is. So you have a couple Could of parcels owned by Brunswick and then the houses. And both Brunswick and at least one of the property owners indicated they were simply listening last time. Um, yes. I don't think that they really are interested in getting involved. Advocating for it. Yeah. So John said yeah. there's, he did look, there's not a place to turn around except to drive away the fence at the bottom. It's way too narrow. The fence would have to be removed and the ditching wouldn't be where we would need it to be. How wide is our right away through there? I don't think it matters. That yeah. My understanding is it's straight the right away. We don't have the room to turn around, and that is the exact reason we got rid of some of the properties where we were having to go down into them and then back all the way back out into oncoming traffic to to do it. And some of them were were you on them? Remember the Tedford one? We were back around on their lawn to turn around, and we went back in the spring and rebuilt their lawn every year. I mean, that's kind of, I believe there was a turnaround there, but it's not on town property, yeah. which we got into on a few of them, too. I mean, yeah. I, it just feels yeah, no, like right. we're if, going right down the this, path if of... This, if this had been maintained by the town back when we went through that process it been on the list. seven years ago, we would have gotten rid of it then, <laughs> along with a bunch of the other ones. Yeah. So it seems a little hypocritical if we were to take it on now. It would be a swerving policy choice for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want to be unpredictable. I, don't know. I think that's your I answer. The, I think all the reasons back then are still valid. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I do too. Unless they can prove to us why we have a lot more right away there than what shows on it looks any of the just, documents. Yeah, looking at GIS maps obviously don't align perfectly, but the widths are similar to Stock Farm Road. I, I would imagine it's a three rod right of way, which is pretty standard. It just yep. got converted and converted again down to that legally established trail designation. Ask John how many times he's got to go forward and backwards to stay within a three rod right of way and turn around one of the town trucks. <laughs> it's like you've seen in Austin Towers where he gets the thing stuck in the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's your, I think that's the uh, go back on that one. Unless there's something there we're missing. All right, Kimball Library Cupolo Project Funding Update by request. Hi, I'm Amy Grassman. I'm the director of Kimball Library. Up one, something you've probably seen 60 times already, but just in case. This is all the set of capital expenditures that we've made in the library in the past 15 years, and then the capital needs that we have received for the next five. Um, 
I appreciate the select board allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm not a natural speaker, so I'm using notes. Sorry, I don't have the best presentation skills ever. I will say that the library is 120 years old now. It's a building that's always evolving. And when I look back at the folks who have a living memory of the building, um, one of the major changes that happened there happened in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, board, library board members like Patsy Finch or Debbie Tewksbury, names that may ring a bell for some of you, were involved in a huge community fundraising event. And the purpose of this was to renovate the basement of the library to make it available for new services. Before this time, the library services were all contained on the main level of the library. Um, and the trustees at that time knew that youth needed much more attention at their public library. At the same time, the building was made compliant with ADA, which is appropriate. Everybody should be able to access a public building. Um, it is kind of fun to talk to folks who may come back after being away from the library for 50, 60 years to hear that, oh, I used to have band practice in this basement and we came across from the school that was across the road or, you know, what, whatever else happened. But now it's a youth library. So um, also in the 1980s, the library was added to the National Register of Historic Places, which is no small feat. It's quite... Uh, a rigorous um, application that has to be made in order to be put on that register. And one of the fantastic things about having that designation is it unlocks money for the library's maintenance. Um, I believe it also has benefits for the town's downtown designation that there's a building on the historic register. Um, in the 1990s, there was another huge um, move to maintain and improve the building. And so people like Ellen Reed and Terry Berbee were on the library board at that time. Um, the roof was reslated. So that's a 100-year proposition, which is fantastic. They built it right the first time around, and now hopefully we'll get another 80 years out of that roof. The front entry was, um, the front steps were reconfigures, new front doors were put in, and central air conditioning was installed, which, believe me, after the summers that we've tracked um, for the past 23 years that I've been there has been really awful. And the primary benefactor there was John Nugent, um, whose name, may, again, may or may not be familiar to those of you who've been in the community for a while. So all the way along, generation after generation of library trustees who were elected to the library board um, by the voters of Randolph have taken huge care with maintaining the historic quality of the building. So when you come in the front door of the library, it looks largely the way it would have 120 years ago, except the paint is not dark red anymore, for which I personally am grateful. Um, but the woodwork, the paneling, the facade, the cupola, all of those qualities are still in place um, and very carefully maintained. I arrived at the library in 2001. Um, we have undertaken so many capital projects in the time that I've been there. And I mentioned that the list that you have is just the past 15 years. Um, all in all, I think that $370,000 and change has been put into things like um, upgrading the HVAC so we now have mechanical ventilation. Um, replacing the wheelchair lift so people can still access all parts of the library. A fire sprinkler system, I mean, you can read these things. Um, I think that the fact that we have been able to undertake all of these capital projects is yet another um, indication of how valuable the community finds this resource. So I don't think it's you know random community members who feel this way. I looked at the Randolph Town Plan recently. This was approved in 2019. And for Kimball Library, the goals are to support the library as an essential town service, um, 
and the actions to implement the policy include continuing to upgrade the existing building while maintaining its historic character. Um, and then you can see the other things are conducting an energy audit, yes, and also all the cooperative relationships that the library has. And I think we have been really successful with all of these, um, with all of these actions. So my work as a public librarian is all about community resilience. It's about helping people build connections with one another. It's about helping them achieve their life goals, whether that life goal is to apply for a job, um, to come in and print out the, the sermon that they plan to deliver, to find the, the best books that they want to take home for their toddlers, whatever that might be, that's what we're there for, is to help people succeed and to help them build connections with one another. So just to give you a picture of what my day was like today as the director of the library. I started at Vermont Tech where I was returning a book for a patron that we borrowed on their behalf. I delivered books to in-home child care providers who can't round up the 10 kids they're caring for to bring them to the library. So we bring the library to them. We hosted a cooperative of homeschooling families who use the library on Thursdays to do um, group learning. Um, I also had a family come in who homeschools and I prepared for them a bunch of books that we borrowed from them for other libraries. We had two Dungeons and Dragons groups meeting today. We had tech drop in time for folks who have technology quandaries, which who doesn't, um, to get help with those things, to solve those problems. I had a companion come in with an adult with a development of disabilities. They sat and read and enjoyed each other's companies. We had um, the person who's presenting about her canoeing voyage from the, for the length of the Connecticut River on Saturday come in and get ready for her presentation. We had drop in chess time today. We had a science fiction and fantasy group today. Also, people borrowing books, believe it or not. Um, people accessing the 24-7 food pantry we have outside of our door. Families reading together. I mean, it was like a madhouse in there today. Okay, just, it was, it was crazy and full of energy, and I honestly feel a lot more uplifted than I did when I arrived at work this morning. So, to bring it back down to, you know, what the folks from Preservation Trust are here to talk about today, we also have a leak in our roof. And I know I've told you this many times. We've had water incursions into our attic since at least 2015. We anticipate it's going to take a million dollars to repair this problem. So far, the funds that we have um, secured include $140,000 from the town, $40,000 from monies that the library board of trustees controls, a $20,000 grant from the State Department of Historic Preservation. Um, honestly, Trini, you emboldened me so much to try hard for grant funding that I hadn't tried for before. And in fact, the $100,000 cost of upgrading our HVAC equipment, $75,000 of that was offset by grant funding. Um, it also encouraged me to do something I never thought I would do, which is to apply for an earmark um, courtesy of retiring Senator Leahy. So we were awarded a $200,000 grant from the National Park Service, the United States Treasurer's Grants. We also applied for and were awarded a $50,000 grant from the Preservation Trust for the Paul Brune Fund and $150,000 from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. What is kind of um, amazing to me in retrospect is that even with all of the grants that I've secured for the library, this is the first time that we're facing having historic preservation easements be a part of the requirement by the grantors. Um, the library board and I have reviewed the easements that are required by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, um, and from their perspective and my perspective, it's a good thing to have historic preservation easements. It means that 
whoever's on the library board, whoever's on the select board has to be responsible for maintaining the building. Um, 120 years of life is just the beginning. In my, from my point of view, this building can serve this community for another 100 years, as long as it's maintained. In July of 2023, the select board at that time voted to accept the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board grant. Um, now, only two of the board members who were at that meeting are currently on the board now, so it's a different makeup. Um, um, but my understanding is that the sticking point for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board grant is the perpetual aspect of the easement. So my question to the select board is, if you decide not to sign or to agree to that preservation easement, if not that money, then what money? We still have $400,000 to raise toward the total cost of this project. That's assuming that you do all agree to the historic preservation easements tied up with $400,000 that we've been awarded. So, did that make sense? Is that confusing? I guess it made sense. Yeah, no, no, he's, he's, say that again. So, we have $200,000 secured for sure from the town, from the library, from the Division for Historic Preservation. $400,000 has been awarded, but there are concerns about the historic preservation easements. That $600,000 that has been secured toward a million dollars. There's three. Three. There's three separate grants that all okay. have easements that you would need to give. Two of them are only 10 year and one of them's a perpetual. So the perpetual one is 150,000, right? Correct. Yes. Correct. So the 400, 150. Right. But this. So we're kind of we're going to kind of blur the two topics here, which is why I wanted to go through the other way. But um, <laughs> so we'll get to that. So. Like I said, if not the money that I've been able to find that grantors have awarded, where's the money going to come from? Um, if you look at the 15 years worth of history that I compiled about the capital projects that the library was able to complete, you'll notice that the smallest chunk by far came from the town. Um, 40, 45% nearly came from grants, 40-ish percent, I'm, I'm definitely rounding here, came from funds that the library board was able to allocate. Um, somewhere between 15 and 20% came from the town's coffers. Um, it should go without saying, a leaky roof is bad, right? And it's only going to get more expensive the more water that comes in, the more damage is going to be done. The cost for doing a project like this is not going to go down. Um, so that's that's what I have to say. I just will also add that um, the folks from RACDC talked about the tourist traffic that happens downtown, we definitely see that at the library. Folks come into the library all the time because they're touristing. The thing that really stands out to me is the folks who come in and tell me, I moved to this community because of this library. Like, don't underestimate how important this aspect of your community is to folks who are considering moving here. Um, yeah, that always makes my heart a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, my work tomorrow is to review the five proposals that we received to bid on the architectural and engineering services that are required to design the bid specs to actually restore the cupola. So that's what I have ahead of me. Um, um, and hopefully not filling a great big financial shortfall to actually be able to pay for the work. Answer any questions for you? 
been kind of getting into the next topic anyway, so should we just move? I have some questions about we do? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm just not <clears throat> remembering it properly, which is lately entirely possible. But I, I don't remember this being a million dollar project. Did, did it get it more expensive just oh, yes. recently? Not recently, no. no it's been we like secured, that. we had an estimate um, from a historic preservation person who came um, and did an assessment. And he was guessing back in 2017 that the project would run around 175. So over time, um, I was able to get commitments from the town, from the library trustees with that grant from the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation to secure $200,000. When we put that project out to bid, I believe it was in 2022, the sole bidder came back with um, a bid of $781,000. Sticker shock. Um, it was pretty stunning. Uh, it's been two years now since that happened, so I hope that I'm being safe in thinking that a million dollars is going to cover the cost. That was my goal. Yeah, yeah. And so with the, with the funding which you've identified, so far you said we're at 600000 600000 do we have a sense of where another you know, 400,000 is going to come from? That's work to be done, and that will certainly be a discussion for the library board, three of whom are here right now, Karen <laughs> Reed, Norman Goodall, and Heather Bowman. So I know it will be on their agenda for the meeting next week. Thank you. Any more questions? I think we observed that there is always a cost to defer maintenance. Yeah. Right. And, and the, what has happened in the last 10 years with, I mean, I live in an old house, right? So every time you put something off, it costs more to fix than, than you thought it would. And, and this is, this project is no different. Okay. Um, a lot of questions on that. We'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is the preservation easements and agreements for a library in Chandler. I'd like to separate these uh, and not do them at one item. And uh, our packet starts with the Chandler one. And um, we have a couple folks here from the Preservation Trust. And Trevor and I met with them. And in the packet, you saw that they changed they went back and negotiated a change so that the Chandler one comes down to a five-year. And I tried on the five-year from when the grant was awarded, which has been five years, but it's five years from when you sign it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, you, don't, you lose everything you don't ask for. Um, and so on that one there, um, it's also, not as restrictive. So you have the easement in your packet. Does anybody have any questions for them on that easement? Yeah, so it'll be, it doesn't get filed, it's a preservation agreement, it does set some parameters, it does provide some ability to talk through what happens when a problem comes up, what are some of the big themes um, from both easements, in terms of what we talked about back in August and even before. So it's, so it's changed from an easement. Uh, it's just like a side agreement. No. I think we kind of made a lot of progress with that one. I feel pretty comfortable with it at this point. Okay. Anybody have any questions from the audience on that one? I don't think that's our challenging one, so we... Anybody want to make a motion to accept that one? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, there's only that one change to one of the items. I can send that to you if you want. To back on where it just clarifies the roles of the town versus Chandler. That one of the items. Okay. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so um, on these, I'd like to take the, the two of the 10-year easement separate from the perpetual one, because I think they're, they're two different issues. Um, so we have um, $200,000 grant, which is the earmark. That one just has a 10-year easement. And then there's the Broom Grant, um, which during our conversation, they talked about um, there's potentially another 30,000 to add to that. That's why it's the 50 to 80, and that's also a 10-year um, easement. And during our conversation, so you'll notice that the document you have has some changes to it, but there's also a two-page um, document at the start of it, which is where we, in the conversation when we were talking about roles and responsibilities and you know what we what we do if a project comes up at the library and they want it done but we have this capital program and other projects that are underway that we got to fund we can't where do you're in the middle of a upgrade to the police station and the library project comes in we can't really stop the police station it was that whole if you have projects that need to come in, they need to go through a process and a queue and come up. So the two-page document is to try to capture that and sort of what the roles and responsibilities will be and to put some meat on it and to flush out some of what's actually in the easement document, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't did you, did everybody have time to read the of documents. Um, the nice thing with the MOU that goes on the side is that it spells out the stuff that we've talked about in terms of how we'll handle conflict. What it does is put it down on paper so that at some point in year eight, none of us are here, and something arises. There's a framework that reflects the conversation. We try to work out whatever it is, come up with solutions, and move forward from there as opposed to ending up in court and you're responsible for these legal fees and what's likely to be the practices just laid out. And that's that's the thing. So for Ava. So my understanding of what you guys have asked for is tonight you actually need a decision on the Broom Grant. We need right. a decision on whether or not your um, your your intentions of accepting um, an easement on the property. And because the sort of cascading funding and the way they it works in the process is they can't they can't start responding to those bids until they have um, a commitment that you're willing to do an easement or else they because they're using the congressionally directed spending grant to um, pay for um, pre-development work. So we need to know by the end of November. On the, on the SAT grant and the Broom grant tonight, but not necessarily the VHCB perpetual easement. Not necessarily on the VHCB perpetual easement, but there will only be one easement on the property. There won't be two. So uh, it sort of behooves you to kind of make a decision all at once, if possible. If, you, if you're willing to commit to the 20 years, um, right now, we don't necessarily need to sign that right now, um, but need a little bit more time to deliberate about the perpetual easement, that would be okay. Um, but you could also make a decision about So them. your additional 10 years means you go to a 20, not it's an, another it's, one it's, of Yes, it's years. additive. It's 10 years for each, so it's a total of 20 years. I didn't understand that, did you? You knew it was 20 years. Look, there's not some Um, yeah. Okay. Is it, um, are those easements only for the cupola or is that the whole building then? It's the whole building. By law, a historic preservation easement has to cover the entire exterior of the building. And it also covers, um, I think it's the, the space, the public space in which the grant funds cover the work. So um, I can't remember 
how it's spelled out in the Bruin Grant, but it's something akin to that. Um, the easement actually has exterior, interior, the setting. So like your trees and all that stuff, and the benches and the setback benches. from the sidewalk, the perimeter garden areas, lawn areas, lamp posts. Hmm. Do we have to get permission before they can hang banners off the lamp? <laughs> <laughs> That's part of your thing. Before we alter them. Yeah. No, I think I think that kind of signage is okay. But I'd have to review this one a little bit more. Um, Here we go. Carefully. This is the um, <laughs> this is the VHCB easement, which meets the terms of all the other ones. Um, I can re-review the actual elements that are required for the um, for the Save America's Treasures and the Broom Grants. There may be uh, the interior features might be a little bit less, um, but the exterior features are um, they need to all be covered under the. So maybe just the, the base easement is the one they've already seen, which is the VHCB yes. in terms of other mm -hmm. colors. The part of that that could change based on decision making of the, the 20 year term for the two, or is it perpetual? Exactly. So it's the same base that you've already seen for that easement. But the term is the part that works yeah, out based on what you do. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at funding this, right, there's a million dollars here, and there's 400000 not there yet. Can the town wait to accept the 150000 VHCB grant until we have the rest of the funding for the project? Is it still there? And then we just give you the easement required on the other two grants for now, and then the perpetual one comes if we have to do that grant. I think that's that probably could happen. I can't really speak for VHCB on that, but I think once they make their allocations, there's a lot of them that take a long time before they actually actually distribute the grant funding. I expect that somebody got a grant agreement. Did you get a grant agreement from VHCB? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might it might be in there. There's certain conditions that you need to meet in order to actually get the grant funding, but I'm, I'm not sure there's a timing element to that. Um, technically, that money is supposed to be spent by June 30th, 2025. Okay. Which clearly is not going to happen. No, so it wouldn't make sense for us to accept it no, and give well, a perpetual easement if we're not going to be able to use it. I'm, I, I don't doubt that they would give us an extension, but there, I mean, my feeling is they're, they're interested in awarding the money and seeing the project come to fruition, <clears throat> not in awarding the money and then micromanaging the rest well, of your life. Just, they want to move on. That, right? But it happens. They, they want to move on. So there's also, you know, this, I don't want to say tension, but there's this who is responsible for the library building? The state statutes put that responsibility with the library trustees. So the library trustees reviewed the easement and they, the easements, and have expressed no concerns about the scope in terms of the exterior features, the interior features, the setting, the setback. I just want to put that out there that these are the folks who are responsible for making sure that the building, any future building historic preservation project follow the Secretary of the Interior's requirements. Um, so, yeah, let me just put that out there. <laughs> so if you have the authority, why are you here? We don't have the authority to accept the grant. That rests with the select board. We have but you the have authority the authority to, to put an the easement on it? enforce the provisions of the grant once the select board has accepted it. But do you have the authority to put an easement on a town building? It appears that no, because it's a requirement or a requirement for the grant that no, that power rests with you. 
my point is to say that the folks who are responsible for making sure the building is maintained in good order do not have qualms about the requirements of the easement. If we can change the easement so your board is responsible for all the maintenance and upkeep of it and the town has no responsibility, I think it would be a much easier sell. But that's not where we're at. No, but... And, so, and, and that's not exactly what an easement is. An easement is a transfer of real property rights, and so if they don't have fee simple ownership to the building, they can't transfer that right. The town is the only one who can transfer that right. You could have a separate agreement in which they have to, you know, take care of everything related to the building. So the challenge we have with this is that, is the, and we've talked, talked with you about this, it's that ongoing maintenance cost. It's that capital item mm -hmm. and how you work it into a capital program and how you balance it with all the other demands the town has for buildings and structures and, and capital investment. And so, you know, if, if the thought is that the town has no say in what those are and no and isn't responsible for it the board of trustees is then that's a different topic than if it's got to come to the town and be balanced with the rest of the items that's where the concern is on this piece and that's well, why I we got that, to that too. the situation stage. exists whether there's an easement or not you still have to balance the needs of the library with everybody right, else there's right? not the pieces in here that talk about the yeah. enforcement yeah. piece of it yeah. and all that that's where I, the yeah I that's the difference of this no I, I i get that and i appreciated our previous conversation where we discussed that too you know and i and i also remember from our conversation you know this is what i would say is that we've been in existence for 45 years we have over 100 easements that we maintain i think we focused a lot in our conversations on the enforcement mechanism Really what this is about is a relationship with the Preservation Trust in either the town or the library to help steward the building. Meg visits these sites, all of them, once a year, sits down, what's happening to your building, what's going on, right? Uh, working on things like how are you building a capital maintenance fund, all of those kinds of things, so that there are no huge surprises, right, to the degree possible. We've never actually, um, there have been minor violations of easements, but the kind of thing where it's this large protracted court battle hasn't happened. And that's not the stance that we take. We're here to help preserve these places and help you preserve these places. And I recognize we might all be in different roles of different seats 10 years from now. And this is, you know, if you're talking about the VHC, he's in perpetual, I get it. But, you know, I also think, um, I'll just say like, you know, in my previous role, I worked at USDA Rural Development. I understand the funding landscape, the grant landscape, it's really difficult for me to imagine how a project like this goes forward without these kinds. Of, I mean, these are the sources. It's not like there are other sources out there other than private philanthropy, right? And so these are the tools that people use across Vermont to get these kinds of projects done. And as part of it, they do sign on this additional responsibility of having a relationship with the Preservation Trust or with other partners to help steward the property. The final thing I'll just say is I love this town. I think about this town a lot, and when I think about it, I think about the Chandler, and I think about the library. They're just iconic buildings in this community that anchor this downtown. And so it's hard for me to imagine them not being maintained, whether there was an easement or wasn't. there wasn't an easement. Because it's really, those are economic drivers, I think, of, of this community, and just like so important. And I really commend I know it sounds like it's maybe been difficult, but I commend all of you for like your leadership in stewarding this far. I mean, they're incredible assets that any town in Vermont would want to have. And kind of some of what we talked about the other day was too, though, if you go back in time to entities that were there to help, right? And you did things, you used to be able to go to a certain state agency and explain something that happened and walk it through and you came out the door with a plan and everybody felt good about it and now you get a notice of alleged violation you get a penalty fine you get you know inspectors there you you get all this rigid like total so it changes according to kind of who's there and what they're doing and so you know like we talked about the whole goal here is to not set up a future select board with a scenario that they can't deal with and we're we have one of these right now 
we have a legal document that was signed by a prior board that is causing us a little bit of challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I hear you. It's not yeah, that we don't have too. this, and it's not, but you know, it changes. It like does. we can have the best thing going right now and sign on to it, and in 15 years, the board's saying, "What the hell did they do that to us for?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like we are on another yeah. one, you know. It's that's where the the piece is, and that's what this two-page thing was. We mm -hmm. we talked about was to sort of you know what are the roles? What happens when something like this? comes up and how does that work through the process and mm -hmm. I again I would just say like and I get it like we might not be here 10 years from now and yeah. somebody has a completely different approach but for the past 45 years the way we've approached this is when there's a challenge with an easement we how do we help how do we help you preserve and maintain this building where is there funding you can look for how can we um, bring in contractors or expertise to help evaluate the problem Right, like it's always about how do we help you preserve this asset, not like how do we, uh, you know, slap your wrist or whatever for doing something wrong or scold you. That's not what this is about. Um, and I just, yeah, I just think that's really important. I, I totally understand what you're saying. People change, organizations change, the world changes. Yeah. Having said that, for 45 years, we've done this. And, um, and that's just the whole mission and soul of our organization is that approach of helping not an immediate, you know, you're not doing it right. And and to be clear, we're not a state agency. We are a private nonprofit. I understand that. Yeah, I just, just wanted to but be the sure because some what people changed, right? It wasn't the mm -hmm. it wasn't the mission. It wasn't the function. It was the leadership, the yeah. the approach, the We're gonna be around for a while. There is good solid evidence about the stewardship that the trustees have exercised over the funds that we manage and over the building. I mean, you have that in front of us, in front of you, with the story that Amy told you in the beginning, and I think that that matters as well in all of this. You know, I think the goal of the trustees is to work with the town and to maintain, you know, hang do the best we can with the money that we have and make sure that we keep that building and that resource in the best shape that it's possible to do that but the landscape of how you do that that's all that's different now and as you saw from from the estimates you know it's a great question larry the longer we wait it's not going to get any cheaper you know those costs are not going to go down to, to keep that building and keep that, the, the interior of that structure safe. Yeah, well, the way I'm seeing this right now, given what we've heard, is that the, the, this funding represents a, a big chunk of money. Um, if, if we don't get it from them, we don't know where it's gonna come from. It's gonna probably come from the town, and that's a lot of money for the town. The work absolutely has to be done. We can't put this off for another period of years. Accepting this grant with its stipulations is not risk-free, but given the huge benefit of these funds to the town and our ability to act on this project sooner than later, I think it's a, a reasonable risk for the town to take. And I think that we really ought to just, we ought to move ahead and, and accept this money um, and accept that you know people are you know working with us in good faith, and, and that they will continue to no matter who's in those walls. It, it doesn't seem to be an unreasonable expectation. Is there some theoretical chance that we could find ourselves in a pickle in the future? Absolutely. I, I really think that the odds of that happening are small enough that it behooves us to accept the money today. So you want to go for the whole perpetual easement, or just the ones to get them started until they can it find the other It seems like they're all interconnected. I mean, if, if, we're, if we're talking about 20 years I mean, versus longer, I, I'm... Versus longer is perpetual. That's a big difference, though. It's, it, kind of, isn't, it, is, it is and it isn't. I mean, 20 years is, is an awful long time. And well, 150 is longer. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I think I'm, about it. I'm, yeah. I, but we don't. It's still, we don't know the, what the next funding. But that, the money that comes with the perpetual easement is also an awful lot of money that we'll have to come up with if we don't accept it. It's the same argument. I think it's worth it. 
But you I, haven't read the agreements yet either. I've I've heard what what this is yeah. about. I've been hearing about it for months. You should I get read it. Them. I get it. I get I get I get it. Um, and these this is not like we're the only town that's accepted this money. It's, no. This is a common occurrence across Vermont. We would be an outlier. We just we didn't down. take something that other towns did because we wanted to research it, Larry. We can't now say we've other been, towns have done it. We've been researching we this. We've been researching this. Yeah. We have other libraries who've got easements on them. This, this isn't new. This isn't something which has just occurred in front of the board today. Um, it's something we've been talking about for months. I would like to challenge you folks since uh, this, I, we, you guys want to work with us and make sure this happens and stuff. We need $400,000 more. Yeah. So where's that coming from? Yeah. Since no. you're going to be friends and no, this is great. This. I was actually thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like, no, 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 this is good. Like, let's do this, right? Because yeah. this is like actually kind of super fun, right? Like, yeah, let's like sure. check through the boxes of where this money could come from, right? A USDA community facilities loan. You guys don't want to take debt, right? You could maybe get a fifty thousand dollar grant. That's about as high as they go, right? You could look at a Northern Borders Regional Commission grant. I don't know how competitive libraries are, right? I think a lot of the money's actually gonna come from philanthropic donors. What we could do to help with that is we could, I mean, are, are you already working with a consultant on that? I have a connection with the Vermont Community Foundation. Great, but I'm talking about someone like Christine Graham or a philanthropic, it's great that you're working with the Community Foundation, but we could provide funding to you to hire a fundraising consultant that can help you do, like Judavine Library in Hardwick, similar project, right? Uh, they had to put an extension on, bond vote failed like three times, they had the budget tripled. Uh, Christine Graham is a, probably the most well-known fundraising consultant in the state of Vermont. Um, you know, you hire her for an engagement to do a funding feasibility study, like who are the people in the community that might contribute or in the region or who care about libraries. Anyway, the point is, we could provide some additional support for technical assistance on a fundraising consultant to look at that, that kind of stool of the philanthropic funding. I think that there's other, maybe federal funding out there, but the truth is I think the federal landscape's about to change very quickly. <laughs> and um, these sources are the sources, right? Like. Um, so I don't think that there's... But the sources aren't good enough, though. We're not getting yeah. to where we need to go. Yeah. And so why would we accept a professional easement when we still can't finish it? Oh, I and think you absolutely not. can. I absolutely think you I can. Would, I'd be willing today to motion and vote on the 20-year easements for the two grants. And then if we can get more money put behind this project, then I would consider the federal grant. The professional easement. That's where I'm at. Because they would really suck to sign a potential easement and then not be able to finish the project anyways. Or have to pay for it all yourself. Or have to pay for it. That would be a hard one to get past our voters, $4,000 or more. Oh, it would be more. What does happen in a non of, I mean, it's basically a non-appropriation situation. What does happen to an easement if, if it's signed before a project's completed, basically? I mean, there must, I don't, there may not be precedent, but it, maybe there what, is. What happens if you sign the easement, but you don't complete the project? Yeah. Well, let's say that the funding gap isn't closed or keeps growing. Something happens for some reason the project isn't completed, but you've signed the easement, the preservation easement that lasts forever. In that reality, I don't what do think you, do? you sign that. I don't think you will get any money until you sign that easement. Mm -hmm. And I think the money is on a reimbursement basis. Right. So if we sign these easements today and we can't finish the project. You won't be signing the easements today. You won't be. Wouldn't, wouldn't they go close out the easement after the project is closed out? When that's the easement's put that's typically when it's done. Right. Yeah. So I believe and that we do not we do not work for BHCD. Right. So I just want to be clear, but we can get clarification on this. My understanding is you wouldn't actually sign an easement that could go into effect until the project was completed. Mm -hmm. It's like the last thing that's actually done and closed out. So to your point, like, I mean, I think what I hear the fear is you sign an easement, the project doesn't go forward, all of a sudden the roof is still leaking and now you've got to fix it with your own money. Like, that's not a scenario. Yeah, I don't happens. think that would happen. Mm -hmm. So where's the money from? I, I'm telling you, I think the money comes from um, private philanthropy. Like, we work on these projects all the time. They're three-legged stools. State funding, philanthropic funding, federal funding. You've got a ton of federal funding in this. When we were talking about the funding, the 150000 DHCP, if it was 50000 
didn't require an easement. Is that correct? No, oh, it's not. One, it's, it's not perpetual. No, it's it's the um, it's the Brune grant funding that um, at fifty thousand dollars we were able to negotiate a preservation agreement. VHCB funding always requires an easement. A perpetual easement. A perpetual easement. So the Broom grant, the additional 10 years, is only if it goes up to 80? N no. Um, they they basically said because of the the amount of money that's going in through the congressionally directed, it's all administered through the Park Service. It's like the same office because you're getting so much they want an easement, they need an easement on here, and it has to be a 10-year easement because of the amount of money. Okay, so I got that, right? The 200000 requires a 10-year easement. And the 50000 requires an additional 10-year easement. Right, but you just said if that was 50000 there was an agreement, not that. But you're saying because no. it has the 200 yes, ahead it of it, they want another 10 years to get yep. mm -hmm. 50000 And then the perpetual one, I thought we had a conversation about about it not having to be perpetual. Was there a condition under which it's not perpetual? No. Not for the VHCBs. No, no, that's state funding, and that's just their requirement. Is there a cap of 150000 Is that why we're only getting 150000 I don't know. If is you, there what? The is, that, is that the cap of the 150000 I believe we applied for one hundred. So the fact that they were willing to grant us 150 was like... Again, right. Right, but if, if their whole entire mission is to make sure stuff like this gets taken care of, it's still a drop in the bucket, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of money, but we still need four hundred thousand more. So, if that's their if that's their goal is to preserve the the buildings, then we need yeah. more. Well, well it's one hundred and fifty thousand. Would you sell a perpetual easement on your property for one hundred and fifty thousand? Right. I mean, right. I wouldn't. Yeah. I still think that 150000 it's there, it's sitting there, but we shouldn't make the decision of a perpetual easement until we know we need that money. Right. Like, if you go out and are very successful in your capital campaign and you come in with extra, we don't need that 150 We don't have to give up a perpetual easement. Right. I, I do believe that you were suggesting other potential ways to free up town funds for this project. I'm also not aware that all of the ARPA funds for the municipality have been, maybe I'm wrong about that, but have been committed, so. I think the ARPA funds are committed six different ways from Sunday, mm -hmm. but. I mean, my request over and over again was to get ARPA money to help with this project, and that was a decision that you went other directions with. And there's a difference between doing your capital campaign for $400,000 and doing one for Five hundred, five was six hundred and fifty. You know, five hundred and fifty. I mean, it, it. I think there is a big difference in there, and I think if there you're talking about difference. risk to the town, risk to our buildings, the risk that we might fall short of that goal of using with that large additional amount seems is much more present in my mind than worrying about who might be administering the other end of this grant fifty years from now. But you're not, right? It's sitting there on the shelf. You just haven't accepted it yet until you figure out what your capital campaign is. If your capital campaign comes in higher than the four hundred thousand, then you don't have to and you don't have to tap into well, that. But then you don't have a perpetual easement. Trini, that's assuming that there aren't other things that are going to come up that are going to require work. I mean if it and if you look at the, the document that Amy gave you about capital projects in the future, I mean it's not like they're going away. There are other things that we have to look at as a board of trustees. And right now we're talking about one project but and one but, campaign. Well you want to do it for everything instead of just for the we have, we haven't even gotten that far yet. We we are waiting yeah. for the board to come to a firm to come to a decision about whether we have the money that has been awarded so that we can plan going forward. You know, it, it's we're, we're living in limbo here, and while we are doing that, the the cost of the project itself just increases. Yeah, but you're not in limbo because you still need the four hundred thousand dollars no matter what. So that project still needs to be taken on. Can I, can I suggest too that, that just uh, we work on a lot of these projects, uh, do a lot of fundraising, and 
I can tell you like the conversations with major donors is what's the other funding that's in there? Who has skin in the game, mm -hmm. right? Does they have the town put in money? And you have, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, well, you know, what about parks? Like they want to know who's in and VHCB, you know, is one of the main sources, right? And so it's a pretty, uh, I think it could potentially be a challenging conversation with a donor to say, um, yeah, we need to raise um, $550,000 um, because the town doesn't want to accept a, an easement from Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Like, that just makes it harder. Well, I think that the town might be more comfortable doing the potential easement if we had it fully funded. So it's the same thing. It's already pledged. If we got to a certain point, then we would probably be considering it differently than just taking out the easement. I thought I thought they, I thought it was just pointed out that the easement doesn't actually happen on paper until all the funding is secured. I mean, isn't that, isn't until the project that is when you commit, the project is completed. Right, but and you it's commit completed. to it when you sign the grant agreement. You commit to it. Yeah, so I, I would just encourage everyone to just think about the the history and the legacy of this building. That that it, it's a pillar of the community. It has been for a very long time. And that this building was a gift from Warren Kimball way back to the town. That that the town got it essentially for free. Um, and it's a, it's an architectural gem. And I think a lot of people really love that about this building. And I've I've lived in a town prior to this town, 21 years ago. Uh, <coughs> in rural North Carolina and was a town that was had a very dilapidated building that was severely underfunded and it had old books that had a lacking collection and nobody went there, nobody appreciated that library. We have something very special here and uh, it, this is really important. I, 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 I understand the hesitancy, but when I look at the fact that this is a, this is an easement about preservation about the historic nature of the building. I don't understand why there's this hesitancy about that because it's basically saying, you want this building to continue being a library and continue being the architectural gem that it is. We don't want it to turn into something else, right? So I know like what happens one day if it's not the, a library anymore, right? We don't want, you know, and I know that when you have work done in a very special building, you want the work done correctly. You don't want it done shoddily. You don't want it done poorly. It's, it, it's my sense that that's what this is also about, is making sure it's done correctly so that it preserves the legacy and the architectural aspects of this building that make it so special. So I think that's important to keep in mind as you consider all these things. And I would agree with, with Larry's points that he made. Just anticipating the text messages and other things. We lost internet. That's why the same went out. Among the things I don't control in life. That's <laughs> one of them. I hate to inform everybody. Oh, Scott just wrote, the meeting went down. I would be comfortable making a motion to accept the two grants, the easement on the two, the SAT and the Bruin grant. I want to be really clear if we don't sign off on the other grant that has a perpetual easement. Exactly what is going to happen? All right. You can talk to Elizabeth Egan at VHCB and she can tell you exactly what's going to happen. But I think that they will approximately what's going to happen. <laughs> my, my best guess is that they will be patient and extend the, the, um, the time period. And they really, really, really want to support this project. Would they like to support more? 150 is, um, in terms of the size of grants they make around historic preservation, is really significant. Right, but times have changed too. 
but that one has a pop date right now that we won't need. But as I'm saying, I think Elizabeth right will now. extend so that. You're right, but they need to, it would need to extend all of it. Like right now what's on the table for us is a perpetual easement for a grant with a pop date of 25. That we know we can't meet. That's six months and the bid's just going out for the design check. I think we have to handle it separately. Let me know what the, what the story is, but. I'm, I'm just getting worried that we're going to go down a road. We're going to lose our opportunity to access this Recording in progress. And we're going to put off <coughs> repairs to this building by years, and we could risk losing the whole building because of the, the size of the sums involved. You know, as, as time, as we've seen in recent years, these projects don't get cheaper in two ways. This is a project where damage is happening as we speak and it's getting more expensive every day to fix. And then costs just go up. So the same fix costs more money in the future. So we're kind of like in a double whammy. And so as those continue to build over time, we're going to find ourselves like in an exponentially increasingly dire situation. And we could find ourselves in a, at a point where, where it has gotten so expensive that we either let go of the building or the town itself is going to come up with much more money than we're talking about right now. To me, that's the big risk, is, is finding ourselves in a place where either we lose the building or we spend additional hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to get it back up into shape. What they need, my understanding of what is needed, is you need approval on the 200000 tonight. That's the minimum one you need because that has to be approved and we have to accept that for them to go forward with their design work and their spec. Like the minimum, the minimum. you need tonight is that. And the the broom grant, because that has to, right, that one also yes. has that mm -hmm. December date that you need mm -hmm. it by, which is prior to our meeting in December. What we also have on the table is 150000 from BHCB with a perpetual easement and a pop date 2025 yeah. that they said they can't meet. So no matter what, it has to go back to them to renegotiate the pop date before we can accept it. I don't think we can but, act on that one. But if we were, if we're going to accept it next year or we accept it now, I mean, if we're going to accept it, we should just accept it. I don't see what the point is of putting it off. <clears throat> I don't know that we're all in agreement of accepting it. I'm not saying that we are, but I'm just saying if that's, but that can't be, that can't be our, that doesn't seem like it makes sense for that to be our reason for not accepting it, is that, is that we're not accepting it. Like either, if we're going to accept it, then we're going to accept it. And so if we are, then we should just do it. And, and. Make what I heard, Larry, was that we could keep considering accepting it, but see if there's a way to fundraise another $150,000 instead of signing a professional easement yes. before we sign it, right? So get things started, approve the first two, get things going with the capital um, budget. Sorry, I have a concussion. <laughs> Oh, no. So 100% comes to me, but and and then we um, will be able. To, I mean, I I think then we can reconsider it when all of the renegotiation that needs to happen. I mean, I think I am 100% in support of the library and supporting the library and taking care of it. But a repair to the library versus a historic restoration project. Is very different and this is one that we don't have enough money for and what happens when we have another million dollar one you know in five years or right and so like in 20 years in 50 years right like i what if we want what if the town wants to do something different with the building in 50 years we have no idea what's going to be needed you know like it the the whole idea i am totally in support of seeing this work go forward, but I mean, yeah, I I think we should do the first two and then 
just make sure about the second one that there's, or the third one, sorry, <laughs> that there's a way that we can. I, I don't disagree with what you're what you're saying. I mean, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars does not seem like a lot of money to to me to then have a perpetual easement that makes sure that any future interior or exterior project to the library then has to go through this historic preservation review process. So, okay, so there's, I think there's a couple of things there that you said. And, and first, I want to say that most of what you just said, I agree with and I understand. What I, my, the point I'm trying to make is that we're talking about, I mean, about spending, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to come up with $150,000 if we don't accept that grant, right? And it's going to either come from the town or it's going to come from donors. We just heard that donors are going to be more hesitant to give us that money if they know that we've turned down basically free money from the state. That sounds like a problem. And I can understand that if you're a deep-pocketed donor and you do your homework, that you might be like, wait a second, you want me to come up with money? Because you decided you didn't want to put an easement on your property, that is not a good look. And so we could have a lot more trouble raising the money that, that, we, that we're looking at, let alone the, the 550, we could have trouble raising the whole thing given that stance that the town is, that we're saying the town is willing to take. And then the other thing is, yes, I mean, there's, there's a risk involved and it has a value. The value is really hard to quantify. Is, not taking on that risk of there being a potential problem in the future worth $150,000 right now? I think it is, because otherwise we're going to have to take that money from some other reserve fund today or in the near future. And it's a lot of money for our town. And I think that's a risk worth taking. You can disagree. It's, 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 it's really a, it's something that reasonable people can very easily see differently. And I totally respect folks who don't see it that way. But I see the risk involved in accepting that money today to be a very small risk and worth not having to spend $150,000 of the town's own money and to also make it easier for us to fundraise the remaining amount. It seems like that is a, a smaller risk than, than not doing it. I don't think we're saying no to the money. Right. Right. We're saying send it aside. And if we get Alyssa, the rest Alyssa of the was funding, saying, I was responding to Alyssa. I, I know what I know what you're saying. You know, then we would look at it as a whole big piece. Alyssa, were you suggesting that we say no to the 150 totally? No, I was saying the same thing Trini was saying is to wait. It seemed like you were saying that it's not worth $150,000 to put a perpetual easement on the building. I don't think without so, looking for other options, it is. I think that's what waiting does, is it gives I, us the opportunity to see if there is another way that we can. I, I think we it. heard that if, if we can't make, we, we have to make this happen, right? If we, if we can't raise the money, then we're going to lose the building, right? We have to make it happen. But what, I mean, how much does a roof repair cost? Have we even, I mean, we would lose the historic cupola is what we would lose, right? Like, I, I guess what I'm saying is a million dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> and so to me, it's not about, I wanna support the library. I wanna support the library doing all of their capital projects, a million dollars for a, for one part of the library that then puts the whole building in a perpetual easement is, that's I, where my concern is. Uh, that's, that's an interesting observation. So my guess would be that not fixing the cupola and doing something else with it would require removing the cupola and filling the hole in the roof that would be remaining. I'm, I'm guessing that we're not going to save any money <laughs> yeah. by doing that. Okay. So it, it is really a matter of spending the money or, or losing the building. And it's expensive. It sucks. But that's where we're at. Like, we just are in a bad spot and we have to figure out how to make the best of it. And what I think I heard is that the easement, we're not gonna have, we're not gonna accept this grant, not be able to use it and then still be stuck with the perpetual easement. If we, if we accept this money and we can't use it, it means that the building is gonna go away. In which case it doesn't matter whether we have a perpetual easement, a, 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 um, easement on it or not. Um, the building is, 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 has disappeared, right? Well, so, well, for you to reach the easement. 
Because that's not the case. What's not the case? The perpetual easement, they have ways to come in and make you do the work. There's a whole enforcement section in the perpetual easement. It's not like you, you know, you sign the perpetual well, easement, if, then if, there's a whole requirement in there of everything you gotta do if, and so you're saying that we sign the perpetual easement and we and we and we can't make the building work. The building we're gonna we're gonna write off the building and say we're not gonna have this library anymore. And the and the perpetual easement folks are gonna they're gonna enforce that by saying no 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 now the town has to come up with millions of dollars to restore this building because you couldn't come up with the amount of money on time and costs spiraled out of control. At that point, I think we just say you know what sue us we're not gonna do it. What's gonna happen? There's no way that they're going to be able to force us to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix a building that has no use anymore. I think that's 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 just not going to that's not going to happen. I I still think we accept the first two, and then we wait to accept the hundred and fifty thousand once we know what the balance of the funding profile looks like. I, I don't I don't see the point. It seems like that's making our life more difficult than it is easier. Why is it more difficult? Because we got to take one more vote. No, we because because it. we're going to have to we have to raise this additional money, and we heard really clearly, if you're going to go out to to donors who can write us really big checks, they're going to say first, have you exhausted all the other possibilities for getting public money, and we're going to say, no, we want you to pay for it instead. No, it's here are the funding sources that we have, which are the lists that are there. And we haven't accepted the 150, waiting to find out what else we can put up there. It doesn't mean it's donors. Larry, it could be a different grant. We haven't gone for a Northern Borders grant. Who knows whether you could get that or not. We haven't asked for another earmark in the latest round that's coming out. We just we just heard that this is unlikely. And it, it, and it... So Larry, like, there, so I just looked it up. There's 74 projects that are have a historic preservation easement from VHCB. 74 in the whole state. Like, that's not that many. Right? So this can be done without that, is the point. Well, no, I don't think that's what that means at all. I think that just means that there are 74 projects that couldn't have happened without this money. So they accepted it. And we're going to probably find ourselves on that list. And we should just make sure that we get on that list while we still can. I don't think 74 public projects using this money is, is a small number at all. I think it's amazing that we've been able to do that many projects in a small scale. Thank you. There was a motion on the floor. We made a motion? I made a motion to accept the first two, the brew and the SAP. There a second on that motion. The second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 But I think we're making a mistake by not accepting the opening now. As you have guessed. I have conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries on accepting the first two. So, on behalf of the trustees, I would ask what would you like us to do next? Because we have worked with Amy, we have, I mean, this has been going on for years. You are only really talking about months. We're talking about years here that, that we have been, that the cupola has had a leak and that we have, Amy has diligently worked to get grants to fix it. Trini, you were part of that. You know that they are not lying thick on the ground. So, so where does the board go now? Because you just potentially added another hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's not what we have to find it. Well, so you potentially have done that, sure. So because what, if you decide so not to accept if, the easement, so if it's so easy, so we just heard that there's not a lot of other money. So the next step is to stepping forward into the the other options that these kind folks here said they are willing to help out with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still need to find four hundred thousand dollars no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so if it's been years, then like we can. We need to get moving on that. I mean, that's why the next step is, right? It, the project can't happen unless those step, next steps happen anyways. They haven't said no to the 150. Right. At this point, we've delayed the decision on it. But so you've got the private 
funders in that whole process. Mm -hmm. And Amy and I talked today about if there are other grants that are out there, mm -hmm. other ways to look at it. I mean, I don't know. You've probably dealt with Chris Saunders as much as I have. Like, it's worth a conversation with him. Yeah, and, I don't um, need to say. You I, know, I think yeah. he's very open to a lot of this kind yeah. of stuff. And, you know, I would have no problem having the conversation with him. And if he, they're willing to put in $150,000, we will get rid of this VHCB one and supplant it. Like, I think there's ways forward here. I think, and I think there's other opportunities, you know, that we had talked about today. We, you know, sorry, I haven't had time. You know, I do have a, a job and some other things that actually have to have some of my time sometimes too. But, you know, Amy and I talked this afternoon about is there other ways that we can look for funds to support, to do other projects that the town has to do so it frees up capital funds to do this versus what we thought we had to do. Like, and and I haven't done anything with it. You're right. Sorry. But um, it's only been, what, four hours? But, um, you know, I think there are other opportunities. We just, you know, unfortunately, I had to come here. So, <laughs> Can I actually, I, I first of all, I just want to say thank you for accepting the agents. We're excited to move forward, you know, on those. I think one maybe just final thought that I would leave you with is just as you're approaching kind of major donors, the kind of donors who are going to make, and, the, you know, this isn't going to happen with $25 donations, right? This is like major donors. They're going to want to think about their investment because that's what it is. It's not a gift. It's an investment. And thinking about what assurances do they have that the building is going to be preserved, right? So it's, I just want to like add that extra context that the easement isn't just about the HCD, right? It's about <laughs> folks uh, wanting to ensure that the money that they put up um, is protected. So, but I, I really do thank you for your leadership and for wrestling with what is a challenging issue. And we look forward to working with you to try and close the gap and get over the hump. So we have a police station. Yeah. You actually have a really great idea about like thinking about are there other capital improvement projects currently contemplated for Randolph that might be a I'm not saying this isn't a fit for Northern Borders, but maybe there are other things that are a better fit for Northern Borders yeah. or a USDA grant, right? Like it'd be really interesting to look at the whole capital needs landscape and see if you, you know, if some of that's fungible, like moving it around. That's a really interesting well, we strategy. We have to look at like what's coming up in the construction time period that yeah. this project, and we don't know what that time period is right now. Yeah. So like, what are our capital projects in three years or four years or, or like whenever this one is going to construction, because that's the year you would have to supplement it with something else. But And that's something that a lot of the funders will get together in a town. Like we could work with um, the, uh, community development department will bring together a lot of the funders and help think about strategically how to like plan out a few of the different capital mm -hmm. projects so that we can leverage different funds and different timelines of them. But I think that's the only place in the town budget, so to speak, that we would have a flexibility of some sort to, to do something like that. But I, sorry. Maybe, maybe someday when my list gets shorter, I'll get over to it. But um, we're going to be working through the capital program as we come into our budgeting. So it'll give us that opportunity to look at kind of what are those types of projects that we might be doing in a few years and what would fund it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our proposed resolution for remaining funding. Thank you. One of the things we said, thanks, guys. We yeah. bring back to you at least to consider one of the options is the resolution to preserve those funds. Back at old number here. Um, this language that you see in there is the language recommended by VLCT and others. What it would essentially do is take any remaining funds, which currently for us is about 371. Um, put them into the general fund, they'd be used to pay for operating expenses as allowed, and they create a surplus in the general fund of 371 for fiscal year 
0.5. That gives you two different choices. You can offer to those photos later or you can put them into the reserve funds if the voters created one and there's some guidance in the packets on that. I think it would be might behoove us just to obligate the funds and be sort of done with it and think of it that way. Um, I wanted to provide that option. There's still the list of unfunded items from before, which total another 350. Um, somebody possibly looked up like the, the budgeting software. There is an ongoing annual maintenance. So that's a, the setup fee that we would pay for, probably a prorated amount and would buy us into a full year um, or through a full year. But then that's got an ongoing expense between seventeen and twenty thousand dollars. So it's cheaper than a person to help us out, uh, but certainly has has a cost associated with it. Um, um, so we had um, the costs, the match funds for all of the disaster. Mm -hmm. Are we able to just? I thought we were going to look at paying that using ARPA instead of taking it out of our operating. I think we could if we did, if you did the resolution declared them, you know, that we were going to use them for eligible expenses as laid out, then you could use those surplus funds that would be created. Would we have to move that money into a special fund though, if we're going to use it for North Randolph Road? Not That's unless for some reason, expenses. yeah. Uh, what we could do at that point is put it into the bridge and culvert reserve, for example. Um, since it's an already created reserve, so there'd be an action of the board, or we put it in the budget, for example, as long as it happens before it's obligated before it'd be June 30 in that case, is what the resolution buys is an extra six months. You could try it now if you want um, instead. So we got permission from Jaron to do the displacement two. cleaner because it takes the phones, obligates, expends them, yeah. creates the surplus, and then we don't have any of the reporting pieces because we're reporting on the first action. Yeah, we agree with that. That. Yeah. I'm just wondering if we had to make a special one, an emergency type thing, like. But if you think we can do it, can we do it without with bridging culvert? Because it's going to sound through it's all that tree and debris removal. Uh, yeah, I think we could put it based on the fact that they recommend that you create an additional reserve and just name it something, you know, really feds, it's not our for money, is what right. you name it. Um, Don't look here. Right. <laughs> We're using the same principle, which these are existing reserves. So you just, you don't have the voters create an extra one. We're using the ones the voters have already created at some point. Um, because that's going to get that one that he, that we didn't get approvals from him on that one's going to get expensive on the slope the yeah. middle slope there yeah he wants tilings and all that down through the ledge that's cha -ching, cha -ching. the positive that's 90 percent funding right? right from FEMA but still yeah. would be surprised to see that High six, low nine, or low seven figure. We got yeah. pilings and yeah. Well, and filling a portion of that brook and and adding a culvert and all that, then could get it. Yeah, we went with that one. That's the last of it, though. Right, all the rest of it's done. And we can offset that with. I mean, to be that slope, yeah. I mean, timeline wise, the other two have a pathway, although one's more exploratory. Um, okay, scratch. Then there's the bridge. I mean, that'd be the other one. Right. We've got enough in that bridge and culvert reserve to make a match on that if we had to, even if it's a couple million dollars we're still okay if we have to make 10 percent of that say and it actually it's less because the way the 90 10 what are we down to the way they left the seven and a half so we're down to two and a half Is that did i read that right there was an email last week that had some of the changes that the state might keep the seven and a half because originally we we're going to split it regardless of the <laughs> state seven and a half yeah there's a proposed surplus in the general fund and that's some of how they were planning to 
these are in a budget adjustment. So we can do this in December. Would... I just wanted to give you the option and get you thinking about it. Um, but that would be the end of the line, certainly. Put the money where it goes before the end of the year. We had till 1231 to make the decision. We can also still obligate on other things, but I did mention it was an option we didn't talk about it last time, and I did want you to see it. Um, so we we already approved a bunch of this, right? Yeah, the, the amount left that's in that draft resolution is the amount that remains. So that's 371. And so we still don't know our final number for FEMA, the 18 or so. Until we know those slopes and those bridges. Yeah, it's tied with the delays in the hydraulic study for the North Randolph Road Bridge. And that's, we got into the state's queue, but everybody was in it. And when we jumped in, we were, I don't know, 56, 58, something like that. So we moved to the front. Yeah. We did get approval on two of the sites for the town to go ahead and do it, but it's that one big one that, well, we got approval for one. The other one is approved if we get down in there and scratch around and it's, Find the ledge well, we think it is. Yeah. If it isn't, then we don't have approval. We have to go through engineering. We had initially we could go through and do the initial remediation of those slopes. And then it was the no no, you're gonna have to have all of this engineered. This is you know the sky spawning is terrible if we'll never. So we went out and looked for an RFP for engineering services, couldn't come up with anything. We asked around about requests for qualifications to lower the bar for both the bridge and the slopes. We haven't been able to find an engineer that'll touch. And stretch, so we stayed in communication with the guy at DEC to say, What do we do? Like, we're gonna lose the road if we don't do anything at all with the current rate of erosion and the way the slopes are sliding. So, we went out, visited, got approval to fix one, explore another, and then there's a middle one that we still may need to do something different. There. So, that's why those are still they've had that longer history, and the bridge is really hydraulic study. And we had that in the RFP the first time we went out, thinking maybe we could combine it into the engineering. But nobody bid on either one. It's a dual hydraulic. So you got North Randolph Road and Kibbe Road, and then where they come together. So it's all of that. But they got a, and uh, they said they wouldn't approve us doing anything with the bridge until we had at least that study. They could require more depending on the results of it, but um, it's, it, it's going to be expensive when you look at it because you're it comes down North Randolph Road, crosses under it, then it turns and comes back over and comes under like Kibbe Road intersection right there where it meets all the water coming down from Kibbe Road and goes right up back under the North Randolph Road. So you not only have the volumes coming in, you have the impact of when they meet and turn to head underneath the road, which is what caused that whole bank to come down, which is all sand. Yeah. That's all good. Sands and clays and balled up trees. And but Darren was pretty clear that, that in his, the river's guy, that he's not surprised there's no, PE willing to put his stamp on this stuff. So there's just a lot of challenges there. It's, there's no other good option. You're not improving Kibby. Yeah. Certainly not with the, the bridge of fun there at the end of it that's sitting on foundation <laughs> field stone. Hold your breath if you go over that. <laughs> But you just don't, you wouldn't be able to get the widths because the slow. Like you're just not going to be able to go around. And then if you close it, now you're going, you're sending emergency vehicles 11, 14 miles around. But, um, and then there's a question about whether that road is even closed by correctly because if you can't get the width required of a class three, but it is a class three right now. And whether it should be seasonal. Yeah, there's some sections where it's, I don't know how they're. That's fitting. what we came away from that site visit with. Maybe it should close its road in the winter and maybe it shouldn't be a class three. Um, I'm not, anybody feel like we got to wait till December to do this or want something more? Or, I mean, it's 
Sam isn't going to come under that money, right? It's no, I don't think so. We got to go with pilings on that slope and on a much bigger bridge down at the bottom. There's no way we're coming in into that. Yeah, those two together, about three and a half. Before you get out of the gate, probably. Um, two and a half for a bridge. Uh, what the length is on that one that they make us do pilings on mm -hmm. and then backfill. And not. I bet you're. But you're one and a half to two million just on stabilizing that bank because I don't think it's going to be just right there. I mean, we're continuing to lose the road. We're we're into the travel lane on that right now. I bet you're going ways because you got to block the river from coming in. Yeah. Not good. And then you got to fill the river in with rock and something. There wasn't yeah. enough room to work in there, but we're going to fill it in. Oh, it's to bring it up to <laughs> get out of the V because it comes into a V. So the thought is if you bring it up here, you have a wider surface than down here. Yeah. Yeah. That was what I, <laughs> when I was saying, I was, yeah, I was giggling. Then I got distracted by a chickadee, but <laughs> now I'm back in where I was there. Um, I bet, you know, if we look at what we've already spent, our match portion of that in the East World way over. But this is, this would put it right in and just say, we have operating costs, they're done. Yep. But it would allow the surplus, the surplus in that to go into the bridge and culvert yep. fund, which would then fund these pieces, the match on these pieces. Yep. So and we'd make the move it, I think, at the same time so that there isn't any potential that something comes up. And I mean, it, not the worst case in the world, but so it doesn't get inadvertently eaten just by sitting in the general fund until we move it over. So if we do it, it should be to the extent we can come in and out or in here and then over there. I'll try that motion. I was just going to ask what it looks like. <laughs> so, move to approve the resolution resolution as presented, unless you want to amend it, um, related to remaining ARPA fund allocation to have the resolution incorporated into the minutes. So we'll copy and put it right in there. So moved. Uh, got that, Judy? She'll <laughs> <laughs> be on the recording tomorrow. <laughs> All those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, can we just sign the version that was in our packet rather than come back? No, I can't. I'll just take all mine kinds off. of chocolate in a bowl. I mean, no, we can get Larry here for that. <laughs> <laughs> I can just take my staple out and send this one around. Only five days a week. <laughs> hey, you got a card. Get his door. I can't get into the Let's say get his door on it. That's right. Just a toggle switch. But I think he's, he controls that. I'm not mistaken. He controls who's, what, the, what doors the card has access to. I think so. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm really scared of how to lock it back up because I hear there's like a special it's a trip. Yeah. 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 You have to have to really we'll go out and watch you while you learn. That would be amazing. <laughs> Love that. All right. Follow up from the work session if needed on goals and priorities. Do you need a direction? No, but maybe before we go into executive session, we have the liquor license on there. So maybe what we'll do is You'll recess your regular meeting week at that point. Open as the board of local liquor control. Take that on. Close that. Bring your other meeting up, and then we can go into the executive session. So we'll hold it for there, and I'm going to get it. Uh, manager's report. Anything more in that? Negative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> so, uh... 
Entertain a motion to recess. Recess the roof. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Let's call the liquor board. Liquor control. Uh, to order. First, the public comment for anything not on the agenda. Liquor. We don't serve it. Nothing there. Approval of the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, liquor license for Chandler. Anybody have any concerns, questions, comments, motion? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? If we can make sure we get the licensees so we have it in the file, and we know who's serving, should there be an issue? You can do that. Yeah. We provide you with the insurance. Yeah. Uh, we've listed the town as a additional insurer. We will say it will also give you a list of the licensed servers. But I mean, that would be a one-time thing rather than a continuation thing. But though, but you'll at least see we have who's done that. Is that fair? Okay. I think for year one, just say we have it. I mean, it used to. I don't know if you remember the old applications; they'd have them right in there. And if you need to get copies of the certificates of training and yeah. the new computerized system we don't doesn't they even show up that they have them and they do we can show we can actually give you the licenses too of the, of the that's easy because we have copies of those I, don't think, we need those I think as long as we have the lists okay yeah great entertain a motion to adjourn so we'll call the other board sorry <laughs> <laughs> favor yeah. motion carries uh, I'm going to come back from recess of the regular board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, motion to find that we need to go into executive session. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And the motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. Do you have any chips? Favor? Second. Hi. 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 Sorry, sorry. Hi. <laughs> so we're going for collective bargaining. Collective bargaining personnel and contracts. Right. So we will start to end recordings and kick people off. I'll accept for Alyssa. Except for Alyssa. Oh, yeah. Sure. Recording stopped.